Good morning. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Actuarial Committee of the Pension Review Board. Thank you all for joining us this morning. And the first item of business uh, is a review of the minutes. The minutes are provided under tab one of the members' packets, and I would consider a motion to suspend reading of the minutes. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It, pass it passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, we're going to take uh, an item out of order this morning. Uh, we're going to move next to uh, um, item five of your agenda to bring up the Galveston police. Uh, because of, <coughs> excuse me, because of weather in Galveston, we're going to uh, let them come first so they can uh, get back and uh, uh, deal with the issues associated with the weather in Galveston. So I would ask the representatives of Galveston to kindly uh, come forward, and I would ask uh, Anu, who is the uh, Pension Review Board's Executive Director, to uh, provide us with a uh, brief summary of Galveston and how we came to be where we are. Good morning, members, and uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, just a quick refresher. Uh, the committee first reviewed the Galveston police plan back in January of this year um, and essentially uh, relayed the concern that neither the contribution that's laid out in the state law nor the contribution rate as um, uh, adopted by the city and the plan under their collective bargaining um, is sufficient to cover the existing benefit level and encouraged the city and the plan to work together to come up with a uh, funding uh, structure to pay off the unfunded uh, over a closed period. Um, since then, the uh, uh, city as well as the plan came before our committee meeting again in April as they had requested to provide uh, updates to the committee members. Um, at that meeting the city um, mentioned to the members that uh, they were conducting an actuarial audit uh, of the 2018 valuation of the system. They have uh, provided a copy of that audit, which is included in your meeting packet behind tab 3A. We have also included a sum brief summary of that audit, which essentially stated that the assumptions used by the system in their 2018 actuarial valuation was uh, reasonable. Um, we, the staff also, um, based on the uh, recommendation of the members, uh, sent out a letter to the city and the plan encouraging, again, both parties to work together on a funding solution. Um, and we have also included two documents which are, uh, to, to our understanding, still pr in their preliminary stages, um, and our proposals from the city as well as from the fund uh, with regards to the funding structure that they, they are um, working on. Uh, we have uh, very briefly looked at those proposals, but given that uh, the city and the plan haven't started discussions uh, on those um, the um, different funding mechanisms laid out in those proposals, uh, at this time we will turn it over to the two uh, parties to speak more uh, to what's uh, the substantive pieces contained in their respective proposals. So thank you, gentlemen, for being here. Would you kindly introduce yourselves and the organizations you're representing, beginning with you, Mr. Fenlaw, if you would. Mark Finlaw, uh, Rudd and Wisdom Consulting Actuaries, engaged by the City of Galveston. Uh, Dan Buckley, Deputy City Manager for the City of Galveston. Dave Sawyer, uh, Actuary with Retirement Horizon, engaged by the Galveston Police Plan. And uh, Stefan Smith with Lock Lord, uh, outside counsel to the Galveston Police Plan. Thank you very much. Um, so um, perhaps we could ask uh, representatives of the city, would you like to uh, share with us what you have to uh, say today? Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, uh, executive director for having us and letting us bring you up to speed. Anu did a, a great job of telling you where we're at now. Uh, since we last met with you, we did complete the uh, the um, actuarial audit of the plan. Uh, we're pleased to see that, you know, really there was no uh, uh, material issues on it. Um, we did have some some minor tweaking that our actuary thought might uh, benefit, but it really materially it didn't make any change. Uh, we met with the uh, the uh, the one of the uh, trustees, the chairman of the board, uh, and 
their attorneys and uh, actuary to try to discuss uh, options to move forward. To uh, and the city developed uh, you know some ideas talking regarding to uh, the retirement age. Uh, we talked about the city increasing its contributions. Uh, that meeting, uh, we didn't reach any consensus at all on, on where we were going. The one thing we did determine was that the funding mechanism, as we've discussed here in front of this committee and uh, collectively between the trustees and ourselves, is, is really not uh, one that's going to achieve any, any end result that any of us want. So we again, uh, we engaged Rudd and Wisdom to uh, develop a actuarially uh, calculated uh, contribution. And we received that just this week. Um, I'm uh, sort of excited about what they've identified. Uh, you know, in, in looking what the funding the city may have available to it, it looks as though if we come up with that plan, and, and one of the things, each of you, I guess, have it anew, is that right? Um, one of the things we've tried to build into, one of our concerns all along was the fact that if we reserve, re return the plan to its health financially with a contribution of dollars, that as long as there's uh, an unchecked governance model, then we could again return a plan to a troubled condition. And one of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Fanlaw did for us was he developed some, let's just call them boundaries uh, and guidelines that if we use the actually determined rate, that as long as certain triggers happen, then we'll go down that road. If the plan doesn't achieve its financial results, then contribution rates would proportionally increase on both sides. Uh, if there was a change made, contribution rates would do that. If the plan overperforms or performs as is expected, over time contribution rates would come down and, and they'd reach a point of normalization where the, the modifications to the plan could be made. But the plus in our mind of the city is that it, it establishes those, those parameters where it won't allow the plan to deteriorate again without action immediately to, uh, on both sides, make it equal uh, to improve the plan. To, in all fairness, they have not had an opportunity to look at it. We have not met to discuss this. We just got it this week. Uh, so the next idea is we're going to meet collectively with uh, either the, Mr. Gaynor, who is the chairman of the uh, trustees, or that board, and discuss where to go forward. Um, I didn't want to bore you with any of the history, because I think you all know that of, of where we've been. But uh, we're sort of excited about this, because we think it's a way to, uh, to move forward and, and get the plan back on a sound financial footing. Thank you, Mr. Buckley. <clears throat> and I should have said that Mr. Gaynor wanted to be here this morning due to weather and other issues going on in Galveston, was not able to be here. Um, are you able to briefly summarize for this committee and also the audience um, three things? One, the proposal for plan design changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, plan funding changes and uh, governance changes, if any. With regard to the, the contribution rate calculation that Mr. Fenlaw just came up with, I would defer to him on that. Uh, governance changes, what our concern is we either need to establish a, a methodology where there won't be uh, the ability for the trustees to independently um, modify the plan to its detriment or to the taxpayer's detriment. Um, and the um, the other issue we have is, is retirement age. Um, and those are the three things the city is, is exclusively focusing on. I, if you don't mind, I'll let Mr. Fenlaw discuss briefly the funding methodology that we came up with. Thank you. Mr. Fenlaw, good morning. Good morning. Uh, what we developed was uh, not a pure or traditional actuarially determined contribution rate plan like you know, they have in the Texas Municipal Retirement System. And the reason we modified it is because in plans in TMRS, uh, the cities, when they join TMRS, they do commit to pay whatever the actuary determines, but they also have the opportunity each year if the costs get uh, too high or for other reasons they decide they can't afford that level. They have different uh, options to tweak the benefit design and, and somewhat lower the cost and then the cost is recalculated and, and they can then make it work for their budget. Um, we, we couldn't follow that model because with the Galveston Police Plan, the city doesn't have control over the benefit design. So we, we put in, it's, it's a, I guess a modified ADCR plan where we put in some constraints, some guidelines, a process uh, that would um, try to protect the, the contribution rates from getting too high for both the police and the city and provide for ways to increase benefits and reduce contribution rates. It's a sort of a long-term plan. It, 
it, it is a draft. It, uh, it doesn't cover every single contingency, but we think it, it provides enough um, constraints so that it, in the absence of uh, governance changes, it brings some governance to the funding uh, policy um, uh, so that, uh, that that will protect, um, I guess, the interest of both the police and the city um, uh, over the long term. Uh, it, it's, it's admittedly um, uh, you know, a, a new thing, and so it, it certainly could have uh, some, some uh, holes in it. <laughs> we're, we're open to the, uh, the review of the plans actuary and, um, and, and, and admit that it doesn't cover every contingency, but we think that it, it, uh, if, if, the, if the police were not willing to accept a, an increase in a fixed rate, we think this is a, a, a move in that direction with some, um, with some constraints that will hopefully um, be more workable from their standpoint as well as the city's. Thank you. Um, and good morning, Mr. Sawyer. Morning. Um, would you like to uh, share any observations, either of you, would you like to share observations on what the uh, uh, city has proposed? Yeah. Um, I'll just kick off. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Buckley's recitation of the facts and how we got from the last hearing to here is virtually identical to what um, I was going to say, so I won't bore the uh, committee with, with uh, repeating everything that he said. But um, similarly, we uh, um, have put together a proposal um, on behalf of the plan um, that tries to achieve uh, similar aims. Um, recognizing some of the limitations within the current contribution structures uh, that are statutorily provided um, and actually come to a place where we think that there's um, some real progressive change that can be made to the plan um, that actually results in a reduction in the uh, aggregate contribution rate uh, um, and actually has those contribution dollars more effectively spent than they would be under the current system. Um, it allows the uh, member and the uh, city contribution rates to also um, adjust in a ratio format so that they fluctuate with the performance of the plan and then also brings in play the governance changes um, that the city has uh, requested by um, pr proposing a uh, change to the um, voting structure for any any plan amendment that would uh, impact the uh, um, that could you know negatively impact the contribution or the funding of the plan uh, so with that introduction I'll turn it over to Mr. Sawyer uh, to go through some of the specific point by points of uh, the work that we've done on the proposal okay so I yeah that's a good high level summary um, just wanted to go in just a couple of details of the proposal that the board has presented and again I understand you all have a, a copy of it. Um, I guess the first thing is it, it does appear that both sides are on the same page as far as coming up with an actuarial determined contribution rate rather than a fixed rate. Um, I think that's significant progress because it just hopefully you know keeps this from being an issue that comes up just every other year when something bad happens. Um, the second thing that seems to be kind of in line is that they're uh, kind of a closed amortization period so not just an open period rolling 30-year amortization so both sides have come up with something uh, along that line and then after that you know that's where they kind of diverge um, and, and as Mark had mentioned earlier we're still digesting some of the details of these new proposals but as far as the board's proposal, the concept is that you know the city would contribute two dollars for every one dollar the members contribute. So that's a, a significant difference between the two. But the concept there is that both sides share in the pain, um, or share, and if if results are favorable, they should kind of share equally in either speeding up the amortization of the unfunded, or in reducing contributions, or vice versa as well. So I think, and I think you'd already mentioned that in order to um, make additional benefit increases in the future it would require a super majority um, so um, it would require five uh, board members to vote for something so that's a significant change as well from the current situation and then the the other thing is that the two for one the based on our projections the two for one cost sharing would actually s would reduce the members contribution rate from what they're currently contributing which is as we've discussed in the past it's actually more than the the normal cost rate in the plan so then the, the members would start to see this as more of a, a 
um, employer provided benefit that they're receiving rather than sort of they're they're paying not only the cost their fee, their own benefit but also helping to pay off the unfunded that exists that was created basically before most of these members were even around so um, if you've already I don't know if you've even had a chance I know that we just sent out this materials um, but if you have any any questions um, about either what I've said or what you've read you know I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, and uh, any questions on the part of the members of the committee? Um, Ms. Dush, please. Um, will implementing something like this require legislation? And because we're going into a legislative session, so is there a need to prepare something for the upcoming session? Well, um, when the uh, city and the board representatives met uh, earlier this summer, um, I think everybody recognized that if we're going outside of the confines of the contribution structure in 6243P uh, of the uh, civil statutes, that we would need to have some kind of legislative solution to change the funding uh, um, the, the funding backs background of the plan um, and at that time we had discussed that you know the most effective solution there was to come you know to come together with a, a, an agreement on the future funding and the future design of the plan and then jo seek a joint um, a joint solution in the legislative session um, uh, Today, I, I guess the city council is actually taking up their own legislative agenda that, that has in part of it, I believe, it's sort of a unilaterally um, developed legislative solution, but that was not the understanding of, of the plan. The plan, you know, we had acknowledged the need for a legislative solution, but we're looking at going into it with a joint agreement and then jointly drafting and proposing legislative change. Thank you. Uh, may I follow up on what you just said, please? Is it correct that the city is developing a uh, legislative proposal? Uh, no, it's a legislative agenda which is adopted by council uh, annually, and we had to get pension reform as part of that legislative agenda. If we didn't do that, it couldn't be part of our legislative agenda. So that's why we're there. Uh, we will either, our preference is to do it collectively, uh, but if we can't do it collectively, we have to do it unilaterally. And we'd be remiss to not have that as a part of our Understand. legislative agenda. Thank you. Other questions? So I, I appreciate uh, you all coming today, uh, especially given the weather situation down there. Um, and it sounds like there's progress being made, still some differences, but still uh, a lot of progress is being made in honing in on uh, what looks like uh, the framework of uh, go forward solution on this. Um, just a few comments on that go forward solution. Uh, uh, I, I like the move to an ADC that is a closed period ADC. Um, I would encourage you, there's a little bit in the city's proposal uh, and uh, in the plan's proposal, a little bit of gymnastics that has to happen simply because um, if you, uh, for any future years, roll in experience to that closed period, you can have kind of big swings in your arc. I would encourage you to look at layered amortization uh, and do closed period layered amortization and not try to fit everything into a single closed period. I think it's uh, most important that given the size of the unfunded liability that you make progress on that over some closed period. Uh, but uh, in future years, I think you need to come up with a, a funding policy that works, uh, that doesn't put you in a, a significant um, adverse situation if there uh, is some uh, experience in the future that is that is bad that may force a reamortization of the current unfunded liability, which could cause open up Pandora's box again, uh, is is really what I'm worried about. So uh, have that foresight to say, okay, we've got the debt that we've got right now. We've got to solve that solution, uh, that problem, and then we've got to have a go forward funding policy that actually meets the plan's cost, uh, and we've got to be flexible in the way that we apply that. Um, so I, I love to go into the close, look at layered, uh, but but I, I love that you guys are both pegged there. Uh, I also like the, the cost sharing. Uh, the discussion around cost sharing I think is a valuable one. Um, I think you're doing that in two ways, talking about um, benefit changes now plus uh, sharing of any future experience uh, through the contribution rate. I encourage you to continue to discuss that. It would be fantastic if there was a, a solid solution on that. I don't have any strong reactions other than to say that's a, that's a very productive discussion to have uh, and much more productive than um, 
it's much more productive when contribution rates and uh, discussions around contribution rates and how that's going to work are decided ex ante than in the moment. And it's much better uh, if you're not negotiating around contribution rates that are not tethered at all to plan costs, which has been the case in the past. Um, so keep that discussion going. Uh, I think that's great. Make sure it's tethered to plan cost, and the more you can decide up front, uh, the better off you'll be because you don't want to be in the situation where you're at loggerheads again uh, in the future uh, over these contribution rates uh, because, first of all, it's no fun for anybody to fight over things. Um, and second of all, it just delays uh, the remediation that needs to happen. Thank you. Mr. Marcia. Chair. Um, I would like to follow on to what Josh said. Um, I would really, uh, I like what has been proposed and, and I would agree with the layering. Um, I would stress test, you know, what, what would the contribution look like if you have a couple of bad years of investment performance or if for some reason you have unusual retirement uh, activity. Um, and so, you know, just make sure that, that whatever you come up with can handle some adverse uh, experience. Um, I just wanted to, I, I think, well, first of all, I did recommend that and, and we are scheduled to do some of that because I agree Great. it's important that both sides know um, what could, what's the worst kind of case scenarios they could expect yeah. to happen. Um, I do I do think that the, the board's um, proposal does have some flexibility in there, like not initially, not not until that amortization period gets down to like 25 years, but after that point in time, I think that there is a, there is a lot more flexibility in in monitoring both the amortization and the contribution rates from moving too much. So, and just to just to whenever I read, and of course I haven't had time to fully digest and ask a bunch of questions. When I read the proposal from the plan, I worry a little bit because we're trying to fit everything into the 30-year close. That we want to give flexibility, and the giving of flexibility once you get under 25 is going to allow for us to diverge again from plan costs. Um, and and get back into a situation where we're continually rolling over. I would much prefer a situation where we keep closed amortization on our current unfunded uh, and do layered going forward uh, and use that as a means to tether to actual plan cost and provide some uh, essentially smoothing over uh, adverse experience in, in future years. So um, that's just a much better, for me, ex ante plan that's got less room for uh, contentious decision making and and uh, provides less opening for decisions that would lead uh, contributions to diverge from actual plan cost. Um, I will say too, I think it's I think you're right, <laughs> absolutely right that if we looked at your the actuarial valuation or the audit that uh, the employer contribution is more than normal cost. Um, I uh, and and I think that's concerning. That is a a clear indication of, um, of benefit generosity, so how much uh, retirement compensation are the employees getting. Um, I hesitate a little bit uh, whenever you say that employees are paying more than their benefit is worth, ju worth just because um, you know that's using a specific discount rate uh, at 7.5%. Uh, that's building in a guarantee on those employee dollars, and that's worth something. Yeah, um, there's a lot of other assumptions baked in there as well. Right. So I just worry a little bit that that's sending the wrong signals to members. Uh, I think that we should talk about these benefits not being uh, overly generous and that employees are, are paying a lot towards their benefits. I just worry that uh, mm -hmm. in talking the way that, that you did here from the, the, um, the table that uh, we're sending the wrong signal to members that they're paying on the unfunded liability when I don't know that that's clearly true. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buckley, Mr. Fenlock, could you clarify what effect your proposal would have on three different groups, <clears throat> people who already are retired in the plan, uh, active members, and uh, those changes that would affect new hires only? Well, <laughs> there was discussion about changing retirement age in a meeting uh, after the actual audit and analysis came out. And uh, the, the police um, really weren't very receptive to changes in the retirement age. Uh, we, we, I think the city would still like to consider that, uh, even if it's just for future hires. Um, so right now, the, the proposal for this modified ADCR wouldn't affect anyone's benefits. 
However, part and parcel of, of what the city is trying to recommend is going to have to include some changes in retirement age. Right now it's 45 early retirement, 50 full retirement. Uh, it's about a year off the amortization per year that they increase the retirement age. So uh, and part and parcel of the, what we developed or what we're looking at and want to discuss with them is a combination of both because we still con are concerned about the contributions, trying to hone in on a, 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 a sound contribution rate for the on, for ongoing in the plan and uh, the governance issue, and then it has to be the retirement age. Those are all factors, major factors in, in, in achieving some uh, approach that can get the plan into sound financial footing in the future. Thank you. Did you want to say something else? Well, we do look at this as a, a cost-sharing approach. Um, we don't really agree with the concept that the police shouldn't be contributing more than the normal cost. Uh, for example, uh, if you th think about the last 15 years, uh, the dollars that they've contributed have been invested and there have been investment losses. So should they expect the city to pay for all investment losses and they not pay any? I think it's, it's, it's healthier to look at it as we're in this together, we're going to share the cost and not parse what, what is the normal cost. I mean, Mr. McGee made a great point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that rate with your current assumptions, but that may not be the ultimate normal cost. So it's better just to look at it as cost sharing between the, the police and the city and try to work together. Thank you. Mr. Sawyer? Um, just wanted to, your question was originally how it would affect the retirees, and right. I don't think it's going to have any real impact on the retirees other than ultimately if we can come to some agreement and start funding this thing at a, at a better clip, obviously the, the funded status would improve, better benefit security. But the active members are likely to have to either you know, contribute more or, or reduce their benefits going forward. They may not have to do that day one. But um, you know, I think it's it's something that they would most likely have to do in the near future. So it's something that initially it may not look like there's any changes, but there's no. Uh, I I just don't see that that's going to be how it plays out. So, thank you. Is there anything in this proposal that you've seen that is uh, just a, a deal killer or gives you major heartburn? I. We haven't had a chance to. Yeah, we just received it okay. in the past 48 hours, so we haven't had to been able to really parse through it, you know, item by item, sort of reverse engineer it to, to see how it really plays itself out. But I'll I'll defer to David if he has any initial thoughts. I mean, that was the same. I mean, I think it's probably too soon to tell. Um, I think they are. We talked about the things that were in sync, you know, the 30-year amortization. Like I said, after that, the two proposals are just completely different. Um, so I, th I think it's. I think we actually have a number of questions that we like to ask and get more comfortable with the the, the city's proposal. Well, I'm very encouraged to know that there's some common ground here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a place to start. <laughs> Other questions from the committee. Uh, what's next? Yeah, how can we help? Uh, at this point, well, the city is already. We've reached out to the plan. Uh, we're going to be scheduling a meeting. We're going to sit down at that meeting. Uh, and see if we can start hashing out the differences between the two plans, uh, discuss through our uh, uh, analysis and, and what we arrived at, what they uh, arrived at. Uh, you know, there are a number of differences, as, uh, as Mr. Sawyer um, advised the committee. Um, where we're going to get at the end of the day, I don't know. Uh, again, we're neg negotiating from a position of, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit of weakness uh, because of the structure of the board and the governance. So that's going to be something that's that's key to the city as as we advance the whatever discussions we have is the is governance issue has to be addressed. Um, I share your view that governance is a fundamental problem and that it's not limited to Galveston uh, in this state with regard to pension plans. Um, I'm hoping one thing that comes out of all of this as well is uh, is the city see the city make a commitment to funding. Um, its portion of the uh, of the obligation because I think that's been part of the problem as well. And we're here to help Thank you. if we can help. Uh, Anu is a great resource. Uh, we bounce things off of her. We talk to her, uh, she and her staff. Uh, so we, we see it as a real positive having that uh, available to us as we work through this. If there is a legislative proposal, doesn't Anu, doesn't your staff need to prepare an actuarial statement essentially supporting the proposal so sure so if and when a bill uh, gets filed as 
part of our mandate, we are required to provide an actuarial impact statement as the bill goes through the legislative process during session. Okay. Any other comments? Um, those of you who are going back to Galveston uh, will be uh, watching and uh, thinking of you. I th hope it goes well. Be glad you're not in North Carolina. Right now. We, and, we know uh, what they're going through, and we certainly appreciate your flexibility in letting us go first so we can get back to the island. Thank you very much for that. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll go back to the uh, regular agenda. Um, item four on the agenda behind tab 2A is uh, the uh, Orange Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. And I would ask representatives of Orange to please come forward. And while you're coming forward, just for the record, I want to clarify that the Pension Review Board is statutorily tasked with conducting intensive studies of potential or existing problems that threaten the actuarial soundness of or inhibit an equitable distribution of benefits or one or more public retirement systems. And that is uh, what we are about today, and that is why we have asked representatives of the City of Orange and their fire retirement system to uh, come. If you would, please introduce yourselves, beginning, if you would, with you, sir. Good morning. Um, Brad Heinrichs. The president of Foster and Foster and the actuary for the for the pension fund. Drew Ballard, uh, actuary with Foster and Foster as well. Jody Cowart, the board chairman. Good morning. My name is Sean Ubrey. I'm city manager for the city of Orange. Good morning. Thank you for coming this morning. Um, does anyone have um, <coughs> prepared remarks? Well, we, we discussed that, and um, I'll go first if it's okay with the board. Uh, Mr. Chairman and committee, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here. Uh, I, I, we have sent letters in, and for the time's sake, uh, if you would prefer, i will just make some brief comments instead of reading uh, the letter in its full body, as whatever the pleasure of the commission is. Excuse me, please. No, no, sir. No. Um, my comment was uh, we, we sent a response letter in, and uh, you should have it. If it's a pleasure of the commission, I'll, I'll just make some brief comments and let that stand as part of the record on behalf of the city. Thank you. Yes, we do have that. Thank you. Well, uh, the city and, and the association has a long-standing uh, relationship, and we look forward to uh, resolving this issue with the uh, fire association as well as the fireman's uh, pension board. But we we want to we want to discuss a uh, two-way uh, process in resolving this, similar like what Galveston has an example uh, before you. So we look forward to a, a discussion where both parties sit at a table and try to re resolve this problem currently. And, and and we know it's it's a big it's a it's a problem that's going to take a lot of time and and some meetings. So uh, we're ready to uh, begin that discussion. As everybody else is in Texas, we're currently in our process of adopting our fiscal budget for next fiscal year. And, and the timing of this, this is not an excuse, but the timing of this is uh, uh, makes it difficult because we've set a tax rate and we're in the process, really the, the middle of the process of adopting our budget for fiscal year 2019. Uh, we also have collective bargaining with police and fire uh, last uh, year uh, the city and the fire association was able to uh, come to an agreement on a two-year deal so we didn't have to uh, bargain with the fire association uh, this year because it was a two-year deal so we already had kind of set and set a parameter of beginning a discussion about resolving or attempting to resolve this issue by both parties agreeing to a unique method of uh, trying to address it by uh, giving a cost of living raise uh, but at the same time, you're marking some of that and matching it uh, uh, to go towards the uh, retirement plan. And, and the association and the city's relationship is indicative because uh, both both sides wanted to do more, uh, but we were just rolling off, and uh, Galveston mentioned it a little bit, and we feel for our friends on the East Coast. In 2016, the city... Uh, received a flood and it was a unique flood because it came from the north down instead of a hurricane. There was a large rain in a, uh, re uh, a water basin 
uh, to lead a bend, and so they had to open the floodgates, and so uh, two weeks later it pushed through and it flooded some of the community, and so uh, it was all kind of a uh, force account recovery where the city paid the expenses of that. Some of it is FEMA reimbursable, but as recently as last year at this time, we were trying to dry out like our neighbors in Harris County. And on a $20 million general, general fund side, the city expended $4.3 million in recovery efforts. And, and we feel those are FEMA eligible, but th these are some of the dynamics and the other balls in the air that the city has to balance. And so at the same time, we were working with the association on trying to uh, have a, a healthy discussion about resolving this. At the same time, the council had to balance the needs of the community and work within a tax rate because our own citizens, some of having flood insurance and some not having flood insurance, had to either out of pocket make repairs. And the most important thing for our economy is to keep the citizens to rebuild and, and to come back to the community. So those are just some of the other dynamics. But I, I want to stress that the city is open to a discussion as long as it's a two-way discussion or possibly three-way if it involves the... Uh, uh, fire pension board itself. Uh, the city feels uh, that some of the options available is to realign benefits and we know that that's not a desirable thing for some of the people involved in the discussion. Uh, raise a contribution but, but all these have to be uh, workable from all sides. Uh, the city is also uh, committed to this effort because we are in the bond market and we know that these decisions that we make uh, affect how our bond rating is currently and as we go forward because we have other projects that we need to do to uh, improve the city. And so um, lastly, uh, I, I just want to make aware uh, city management is going through a current transition so I, I, I will uh, affirm to you that in this transition I will pass on to the to the next management team that this is a priority and it needs to continue to be addressed as we move forward. Um, those are just my comments. If you have any questions now, or I'll, I'll answer any questions after you go through the table discussion. Mr. Oubre, thank you. Uh, does someone from the plan wish to make any comments at this time? Mr. Keller. Thank you. Welcome. I just. First, I want to, to state that the, the board does not have authority to set benefits nor the contribution rate. We can bring a recommendation uh, based on the actuary to the, the members. Uh, we did start over 20 years ago at a 9% at a contribution rate with the city at 10. Uh, we've slowly worked our way up currently. Uh, 2019 will be at 12 and a half percent on the members and 14 and a half percent on the city uh, we have here recently gone back with a special study to the members with a possible benefit change uh, at that time I don't believe that it was quite explained correctly to the members I don't think it was fully understood by the members and that benefit change was ultimately voted down by the members. Uh, the board has gone back since uh, with a benefit change that the actuaries uh, come up with are also a 2% increase of a, over a four year period. Uh, again, I believe that the benefit change was not fully explained and I believe that as a board, we're going to ask for the assistance of the actuary to come and actually speak to the members and give them uh, hard evidence to, to help the board out explaining this. Uh, but we, we do understand that there, there is a funding issue. Uh, unfortunately, as the board, we're, we're bringing this to the members. It goes to the union and we're unfortunately locked in with a contract uh, on the, the contribution side, on, especially on the city. The 2%, that's something that uh, the, the members, uh, if, if they so, so choose to implement that, are a benefit change or possibly both. Thank you. Can you briefly clarify the confusion uh, regarding benefits that you were referring to? Uh, 
I'm not clear on what you were saying. The we had a special study done on the uh, normal form of annuity payment uh, after death. Uh, currently, uh, it's for a married member. It's uh, 66 and two thirds, and I'll I'll uh, let Mr. Howard clarify that if, if I get anything wrong. And uh, we were planning to remove that that benefit but we were also wanting to implement an option to buy back into that at retirement and yeah, so, uh, so so I'll, I'll you did a good job by the way on that um, so the, so the normal form of payment uh, for, for the plan is a, is a joint survivor uh, 66 and two-thirds which effectively um, means that the spouse is getting a, a, a free subsidized subsidized benefit. Um, I made it very clear to the board that you know when we're talking about benefit reductions um, that one of the things that I look at whenever I, I, I evaluate a plan to say okay we have to cut benefits where do we start? Um, first, one of the first things I look at is are the equity is is, the, is this plan equitable to all members and and um, the way that it uh, is, is currently structured is that a married member gets a 66 and two thirds joint survivor, a single member at retirement gets a life annuity. Well, if if I'm hired on the same day, make the same amount of money through my career, get to get to retirement, and and um, one and one person's mem married, the other person's not. Well, the value of the of the of the pension is is greater for a married member versus a single member. And I said, you know, while we don't want to um, eliminate spouses from from receiving a benefit in the event of a death of a of a member, um, sh is it fair that the married members get that value for free and and the single members are actually getting a, a lower uh, lower value benefit, and so what we what we recommended is is a place to start was to say let's make the normal form a life annuity, and if a member is married and wants to have a 66 and two thirds joint survivor, that's fine, but their benefit will be reduced um, from there, and there'll be an actuarial reduction, and so that was one of the one of the options that that we gave to to the board to consider to take back to their members, and as you can imagine, whether you understood what I just said or not, it's not. I wasn't the one talking to the members about this, and my hunch is that it wasn't fully understood. And when you don't fully understand something and you're voting, you you tend to just vote no. <laughs> let's let's keep things the way that they are. Um, since I have the mic, I'll I'll continue on and and uh, just for a bit. Um, I've been working for the board for about a year, um, and we we. Came in. They asked us to do start by doing the actual evaluation as of uh, one one seventeen, and we and we prepared that. Um, uh, there were a, a couple of assumptions, or several assumptions, really jumped off the page at us. Granted, we hadn't done an experience study, but we work for about three hundred and fifty public funds nationwide, so we have an, at least an idea of, of kind of what what what. Uh, what the bounds of, of, of reasonable are and, and what's on the high end and what's not. And, and there were a couple of assumptions that just based on looking at the, the current data that, that seemed um, a little bit out of line. And so we made some assumption changes or recommendations in, in the valuation for the board to consider. Um, not knowing anything about like payroll growth and some of those other items that, that I think you guys put put together in your report, which we actually talked about during the during the meeting. Um, so the, and the amortization period was increased by a good 10 years, I think, just in our first valuation. Um, at, at that time, I told them that that um, we needed to do more than just that. Um, and and so we started talking about benefit benefit reductions or, or contribution increases made those suggestions and and I think to Jody's point um, they took those back to the members and 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 they were ultimately shot down by, by the membership um, one of the benefits of this meeting I think today is that I think it's going to provide to the members a little some 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 evidence that that this that that when Jody brought this back to the members it wasn't just a hey would you guys like to contribute more to your pension yes or no um, I think that, that that this will help I think in in in, in that communication to the membership, um, and, and I'm happy to hear that that, that he's saying that he's going to uh, you know, let us get involved to, to really to try to, to explain to the members really the 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 the, 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 the real status of where we are. Um, I think that your report, uh, which was well done by the way, um, 
brings up a few other items that, that we've already talked to the board about. On the assumptions side, um, payroll growth being 4%, I completely, I completely agree. That's we don't have many um, funds that have that kind of an assumption that haven't been making it for a really long time. Um, and when the, I think the report says that that we've been we've been averaging less than three. And um, and I and I and I talked to the board about that, and that's going to be an assumption that we're going to be ratcheting down in future valuations. Um, your, your points about the assumed rate of return are, are spot on as well. Um, we've, we had a discussion with the board about um, having you know, talking to their investment consultants about about either changing an investment strategy or or, or um, making some sort of change to the mix that that will maybe result in, in lower cost items or, or 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 trying to get trying to get a higher return. If and if we're not going to be able to do that, then to lower that that assumed rate because we certainly haven't been getting the, the return that 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 we're. A bit that, that's been assumed historically. Mr. Heinrichs, let me stop you there for Please a moment. Please do. See, see, see if we have any uh, questions to this point. Um, and let me short stop the questions and make just this observation. <laughs> sure. uh, page 7 of the staff's report, which I agree is well done as well, uh, shows a graph that indicates that if the plan, based on um, current actuarial assumptions and methods, presumably, um, hits its seven and three-quarter uh, investment return, in 30 years you'll be funded at about the same level, um, a little below 60 percent. Uh, and that's not a question, that's just an observation, but I think that that speaks volumes about the challenge that's facing this plan at the moment. Completely with that, agree with you. With, with that, I'll uh, entertain questions. And, and that also presumes the 4 percent pay growth. Right. Yeah. So, right. You know, you're, you're right. Yeah. You're right. I mean, we, 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 we have we have a hill to climb here. There's no. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Um, but I think that maybe in comparison to other plans, we're we're more in the in the beginning stages of of, of climbing that hill. Um, we need to uh, first educate the members better as to where we really are um, in this in this in this uh, in this process and get their support. We need to rally their support. Um, to make changes to the pension, whether it's on the contributions level or the benefits benefits side, or both, um, and then we're going to have to continue to work with the board to, to make the assumptions that we inherited a, 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 a bit more in line with what we we fully anticipate the future to be. Josh, so thank you all for being here. This is uh, it's great to see uh, everybody at the table and and a commitment to to working this out. Uh, you know, I look at this plan. Uh, and I see uh, a pretty dramatic deterioration of fund uh, status over the years uh, without much remediation. So uh, the fact that you guys are taking the first step uh, is great. And uh, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult to admit that uh, steps need to be taken. Uh, so I really appreciate the commitment there. Um, this is not necessarily directed at you because I don't think you have much control over it. But I just wanted to highlight for the committee and for uh, the record that um, a big challenge that we face with all Telfer plans is the governance model. Uh, and um, two things that, that you all highlighted um, that, that uh, I find to be very challenging. Uh, one is uh, the way that these plans are governed. Often the, the uh, sponsoring government doesn't feel like they have uh, uh, as much say as they need uh, in the benefit side and can't negotiate over that. Two, often the plan, uh, the city and members find themselves negotiating over contribution levels uh, that don't at all or very lightly consider actual plan cost. Um, in my view, that's exactly the wrong thing to be doing. You shouldn't be negotiating over contribution levels. You should be negotiating over benefit levels and paying the cost of those benefits. And somehow, with many of these plans, we found ourselves negotiating over contribution levels, the result being that we're underfunding benefits consistently over time. Uh, and that's, that's very problematic. Uh, and I don't know, that's, again, not necessarily directed at you. It's just acknowledging the difficult situation that you've been put in. Um, and especially as board chair, trying to uh, deal with that situation as, as the city, trying to deal with that situation is very challenging. So It puts I, a strain on the board. I mean, right. it, really, it, it, it gives them an, an incredible responsibility for Telfer funds in the state of Texas 
relative to other public pension boards across the country where they do pay the actuarial required contribution? I would say it strains the board, but it's also just uh, in terms of incentives and governance structure, it's, it sets up a very uh, easy to predict situation where you're going to underfund benefits. You're not going to be able to adjust. So, uh, And that's what we're seeing in a lot of these plans. Uh, second piece of governance that I wanted to address that um, I think you have a little more control over but is, is still kind of hard is um, uh, is the approach to assumptions. Uh, I think often we consider uh, individual assumptions in isolation. So we say, is the payroll growth assumption reasonable? Is the, the um, rate of return assumption reasonable? We just walk through all the assumptions and don't actually take a look in the way that we should at aggregate results. Um, Marsha brought up earlier uh, stress testing. Uh, there needs to be much more of a look at the aggregate result of the assumptions. Uh, the assumptions build to a funding policy. Mm -hmm. The assumptions are not just assumptions that you know we've got to be in the range of reasonableness. They matter for how much money you get. Uh, and what matters in terms of money is are we actually paying enough to cover the full cost? The answer for this plan is no. Um, so I, there needs to be much more of a look at the aggregate funding policy and its uh, responsiveness to actual plan cost and less of a defense of individual plan assumptions, assumption by assumption. Um, I'm going to continue on my soapbox because uh, I guess well, can unless I you have something. Well, question, and, and again, I'm still you know I'm new at this, um, but my concern from a board trustee point of view is that as a fiduciary to the plan, if you're promising benefits and you know you can't get sufficient income to fund them, you are between a rock and a hard place. You're you're fiduciary to the plan. You're supposed to be making sure that those benefits are funded appropriately. And so I, I don't quite know as a fiduciary how you get out from under this you know, dilemma. One element of the report that jumped out at me, the staff's report, is the uh, uh, investment expenses, um, which if I'm not mistaken are the highest among the TELFA plans that we're the measuring, uh, the peer group anyway. That. Uh, more than 100 basis points, um, and I guess uh, the better part of those, two-thirds of, uh, of those roughly, are going to the investment consultant. Um, how long have you had this investment consultant, um, and do you have an understanding of why this one is uh, seems to be an outlier with regard to cost? Uh, I believe it's been about, about 10 years. Uh, Mr. Tim Sharp is behind us. Uh, I believe he's would like to address uh, some of those questions uh, regarding expenses. Okay. Um, it, you one, if you would, Mr. Sharp, one moment, please. Um, do you, you all have a contract? Is it a long-term contract, year to year? Can you talk about the RFP process that you use to to get sort of professional services? Uh, this when when. His services were initially brought to the board, was before my tenure on the board, and I don't know really what the, the process, the initial process was, uh, but we do have a, a ongoing contract uh, with him. How long have you been on the board, sir? Uh, it's been about six years. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Mr. Sharp? Can I ask one yeah. question? One more question of um, the board chair. Um, so, just to just to note, uh, and this is not really going to be a question so much as a statement. Uh, if I were you, if I were on this board, and I noticed that my fees were some of the highest amongst my peer group, uh, uh, if not the highest, and uh, I was getting the level of performance that I am on the investment side, um, I would really question. Uh, the contract and the advice that I'm getting. Uh, that, and that did jump out. Yeah, I would, I would, I, that should be an item for discussion at your next board meeting. Mr. Sharp, I know we met briefly before the meeting. Would you kindly introduce yourself? For Certainly. Meeting? Tim Sharp. I'm with uh, Greystone Consulting here in Austin, Texas. It's been a pleasure to serve with the Orange Board for many years. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, address your concerns. So I guess you've heard the concerns that we have about uh, the cost that Orange is paying. And are you the uh, investment consultant to the uh, Orange am. Pension Fund? I am. Um, and uh, 
Well, let me ask this. Uh, if you've seen the report, you see there's a peer group. Are you the con investment consultant to any uh, any of the other? Yes, sir. Companies? Yes, sir. I am. Can I, can I hand you out something? That Please. You could you could hand it to staff, and they they would uh, distribute it. Thank you. There are, there are two different things to hand out. One, and here is the other. So we were asked to report the uh, fees for the fund. And one of the things that we've handed out to you here is the uh, spreadsheet that we prepared and sent in to you. And uh, that's uh, the one that's entitled the City of Orange. Fund manager fee. If you could, if you could say this into the microphone, that would be helpful. Certainly. Thank you. Let's make sure everybody has copies. Of So, Mr. Sharp, um, what is your understanding of the nature of the contract that uh, your firm has with the uh, Orange Firefighter Pension Fund? Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, period? Yeah, length, think, length of contract. It's, a, it's at will, sir. Okay. They can terminate it at will. Okay. And I think you probably sense the uh, the concerns of the members of this committee with regard to uh, what the, the um, cost of the contract is. I do. Um, and we just want to give you an opportunity to maybe put this into some context that we may not we may not be aware of. I, I do. I think there's several uh, issues uh, with the peer group comparison. Your your first question was, uh, are we the consultant to any of the other funds in the peer group comparison? This is from your review. And you'll see that the ones uh, marked with a C on the left-hand side, the margin notes, Waxahachie, Corsicana, Orange, Plainview, those are, are my clients. And the ones that are marked with a T in the margin, those don't have a consultant. Those have a different investment structure where they've gone directly with a trust company and the trust company invests their funds in the trust company's proprietary products. They don't have a third party oversight of a consultant. And then there's one that's marked an M. That one's a money manager, Mr. Chairman, where the uh, board has chosen to go directly with a money manager. So <clears throat> in a sense, it's an apples and oranges comparison. We believe, and I would strongly argue, <coughs> that best practices you would have a consultant who is independent of the money managers and is, uh, has independent research, due diligence, oversight of the money managers. Because it's pretty rare, in my experience, that a money manager ever fires themselves. So that's the predominant reason that the fees are less. Can you briefly uh, enumerate uh, what services you're providing? Absolutely. Uh, let's take a look at the other handout that I gave you, the uh, chart that we sent you with the fee schedule. Yes, City of Orange Firemen's yes, uh, Relief and Retirement Fund yes, Manager sir. fees. Okay, yes, thank you. So what you'll see at the top are the equity managers by name and by their asset class, what their manager fees are. Now, I'm getting to your point, but those, those fees are all negotiated with individual contracts with the fund. So this is a what's called a dual contract arrangement where the fund has a contract with us to provide consulting and custody services and then they have separate contracts with each of these managers that you see there. And these managers are all with one or two exceptions, BlackRock Municipal in this, at this point in time, these are all separately managed accounts where the City of Orange is investments are not commingled with others in a, com in a commingled trust fund or a common trust fund. So they're held separately in an account. They belong to the City of Orange only and they're shown on the statement separately as Thank opposed you. to a commingled fund or a mutual fund. Okay. So 
you'll see that the manager fees range from a low of 25 basis points for fixed income, that's traditional long only fixed income, up to as high as 78 basis points, uh, 75 basis points. All of those fees, we help, one of our services is to help the board, A, select money managers from the entire universe. We do open searches from the entire universe, uh, PSN and Forma database, thousands of managers, to try and bring them managers who we feel are best. We present these to the board. When a, when a manager is selected, largely on our recommendation, we then go to the contract with the manager and we negotiate on their behalf. It's pretty time consuming. Uh, because they are a sovereign entity under a Texas state constitution, they have certain rights. So the contracts that they have that we negotiate are to be construed under Texas law, not typical what's in the contract. It would be New York law or Delaware law or something else like that. Secondly, the venue is to be convenient to the client, in this case the city of Orange. So it would be a, a state district court in their place. May, may, may I stop you? I just sure. want to tick off the, uh, the services that I okay. understand you're providing. You mentioned consulting. Yes, sir. Broad investment consulting. Custodial cool. bank services. Custodial services, correct statement generation, yes. Clearing um, of trades. You advise them on asset allocation. We do. <laughs> and manager selection. We do. Uh, anything else? We provide manager research from our manager research department. Uh, the managers are not held to trading with Morgan Stanley, but they do have the option of trading with Morgan Stanley. And if they do so, it's done on an agency only basis. There's no principal trades allowed. And all equity trades are done at the middle inside the market with no commissions, zero cents per share. And any fixed income trades are done uh, without markup or markdown by the trading desk. So uh, a full suite of consulting services, manager selection, manager research, asset allocation. We do stress testing on the portfolios. Uh, all of the above things along with custody statement generated. Yes. Does your firm receive a portion of the manager fee or a payment from these managers that you select? Absolutely not. Thank you. Every of these managers is an independent third party and we are prohibited and will never show a proprietary product, sir. Thank you. Does, can I ask one question Please. on top of that? Does Morgan, so you uh, noted that these managers, um, you said had the option of trading on Morgan Stanley, uh, but are not required to. How many of them do? And, and does Morgan Stanley, the parent organization, uh, benefit from them using their platform? Mr. McGee, that's a wonderful question. The majority of the trades generally go through here because the trade done at the inside market without a commission is generally better execution. They're held contractually to better execution, each manager. They're held to best execution, okay? If they can get that away from us, they do that. That's not the majority of the time. Now that will happen in small cap stocks and international things, thinly traded markets. But if you're talking about the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, the inside market is the inside market. And when I said that the trades must be done, done on an agency only basis, what that means is <clears throat> like on a, a trade uh, on NASDAQ where we have the NASDAQ securities in our inventory, we are prohibited from doing it on a principal basis where we might have a gain or a loss. So the short answer to your question is it's the best execution wherever they can get it without any profit to Morgan Stanley. We, we charge one fee and one fee only, and that's the one shown in the report here. Are all of these managers active managers? In the, uh, in at, this, at this point in time, this was done at, as 1231.17, these are all active managers. We have okay. made some significant changes in the portfolio over the last year and a half, and I have those enumerated on a sheet if you'd like me to give if it to you. If you could just send that to staff, We can please. do that. And would you also send staff following this meeting uh, a comparative of these, uh, the individual performance of these managers uh, compared to their, uh, the benchmark that you uh, apply to them? Uh, managers versus benchmarks, list of changes, and, and in the list of changes we have indexed portions of the portfolio, the large cap domestic. Uh, question to you, Mr. Chairman, is this is the 1231 portfolio. As I've told you, there's been a number of changes. Would you like to see the 1231 portfolio, which is shown here and does not include the index funds, 
or the June 30th portfolio, which is most recent, which does. The most up-to-date information would be helpful. Uh, list of, uh, okay. Other questions for Mr. Sharp? Um, when doing asset allocation, are you doing some sort of um, uh, efficient frontier analysis to yes, take into account the fact that this plan has a negative um, cash flow except for investment performance, that contributions are not uh, do not completely offset benefit payments? We, we do use mean variance optimization in doing asset allocation. I have a study here which I'm happy to, to provide you with. If well, you would provide it to the staff sorry. and they'll get it to us. And yes, it does include, of course, uh, uh, efficient frontier analysis. And taking into account future contributions. Well, that's actually a separate problem from the portfolio construction. As an actuary, I could say yes and no, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think well, I'm sorry. from an actuary's point of view, to, to try to understand how to set an expected return on uh, assets, you really need to have some understanding of what future cash flows are going to be, oh. and and especially whether to weigh a 30-year forecast versus a five or 10-year forecast when you have this negative cash flow is really important. Well, I agree. I, I don't want to say that we don't take into account the fund's actuarial position, but our goal when constructing the portfolio is to meet the actuarial return assumption. That's what we are given. Uh, basically by the board as an objective uh, with the lowest possible risk and the most efficient portfolio on an after expense basis. That's the approach that we take. Josh. Um, so if I look at, the, I'm a results guy uh, and I think it's um, pretty easy to get lost in uh, a lot of discussion around how the portfolio is constructed and so on and so forth. Yes, sir. The results I'm staring at uh, is that um, you've got the highest fees for the peer group. The top four uh, in the peer group uh, for fees are managed, uh, are advised by you. Uh, and I don't know what the performance of the other ones are. That might be an interesting thing, uh, Anu, to look at after the fact. But I can see uh, that for Orange Fire, performance has not only undershot the plan's assumed rate of return, but uh, has undershot uh, my understanding of uh, kind of public plan performance over the, this period uh, and benchmarks. Um, so it's not clear to me uh, what the plan is getting for their money. Uh, and so I would just advise the plan to really have a hard discussion around what are we getting for the dollars that we're putting into this because those uh, dollars, of course, are, um, are, are for the benefit of members. Uh, and um, it it's also seems, uh, the sheet you handed out with the T's and the C's and the M's on them, uh, the only obvious thing that jumps out to me, there's no obvious performance difference that I can tell. The only thing that's obvious to me is that when uh, you're involved as an advisor, fees are higher. Um, and that's that's a challenging thing for me to get around given just this uh, the results that I've seen uh, here. Um, I'm also not sure that I fully understand uh, the how it seems to me, and this may be uh, not uh, fully accurate, but it seems like you're an affiliate of Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley offers a platform and you're driving business to Morgan Stanley. I, it's unclear how uh, there's not some um, something going on there that is helpful to Morgan Stanley. Uh, I understand, so I would love to get more clear on exactly what that looks like and I think the board should get more clear on that. Um, I'm not saying there is anything going on there or that uh, that it's not uh, kind of above board situation. I'm just saying it, it. if I look at this in the way you explained it, it's still, uh, I don't fully understand uh, what's going on. Um, I, I, I would love to know whenever you compare to benchmarks, it's unclear to me looking at these uh, actively managed plans, uh, what value the plan is getting specifically relative to uh, having an advisor that helps them with asset allocation and just purchase index funds um, and, and uh, go at it. This is not, if I'm looking at the asset allocation, and maybe there's more something more complex going on here, uh, but it looks pretty simple. Um, and so that, it's just surprising to me. That, that fees are as high as they are. Ms. Dush. 
I um, I lost my train of thought. Let me okay. gather my thoughts a second here. Well, we don't tip, uh, Mr. Sharp. We don't typically get so involved in investment issues. Uh, yes, sir. Investment issues, uh, from my standpoint, uh, seem to be one um, issue among a number at the Orange uh, Fund, and we're here to help. We would like to, to uh, help the board restore its funding level. Um, as uh, Mr. McGee referred to, I think governance is an issue here as well. Um, and it goes well beyond just uh, the Orange Fund and, and uh, the ones in Galveston and Longview. It seems uh, um, relevant to a lot of, of uh, public pension plans in this state. And I think that that's a larger issue that needs to be addressed. But obviously with these other plans, um, management and, and uh, the, the board need to come together because we've got a problem here. Mr. Um, Chair. Please. May I? Um, does, uh, is the board aware of, of best practices with respect to going out to bid for service providers? As a former consulting actuary, we always wanted our clients not to go out to bid, but, but my understanding is as fiduciary to a plan, there, there's got to be a best practice that every so many years, and I, I don't know with your experience with NASRA, if there's some sort of best practice about even if you love your provider and they're providing great value, you need to check the market as a fiduciary every five years or ten years or whatever, that there should be some commitment for the board to, for all of its service providers to check the market. Uh, I'll add one additional thing that uh, this is for the board um, that you guys should just be aware of. Uh, sometimes it's very easy to get into circular reasoning around the investment rate of return. So um, nobody, it, it, you can get into a situation where nobody's actually making a decision about it. So your investment advisor comes in and says, what's your assumed rate of return? And they use that as their bogey. And they say, we're going to go after that and to try to do that for the lowest risk. Your actuary will come in and say, what's your portfolio supposed to get? And you'll tell them, uh, and they'll use that directly off. Here's what our investment advisor said. And nobody's actually deciding what is an appropriate rate of return uh, and the right risk for the plan. So you should just be aware that um, you know that rate of return can go round and round on the merry-go-round without anybody actually stopping and saying, is this the right rate of return to be shooting after? Are we taking too much risk? Is this the right level of risk? And I would just encourage the board to really step back and say, uh, how much risk are we taking in the market? What's reasonable to get uh, at the amount of risk that we're willing to take? And make a, a conscious, proactive decision on the rate of return assumption. And don't let the advisor just go around and around on the rate of return assumption. And another point to that, and I would direct this to Mr. Heinrichs, um, something you probably know just as well as I do that in the actuarial standards of practice in setting the expected rate of return you're not supposed to give weight to active management over uh, index unless you have very very strong uh, understanding that you're going to outperform uh, the index for a prolonged period of time and so you know active management is a gain that is recognized when it's gotten and not to be used in setting the long-term assumption. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the standards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. But at, and and just to that to that point only on a broader scale. I and mean, the, the assumptions are, are certainly something that we've we've in our first in our first meetings I started that kick started that conversation. They made it. They agreed to some changes, and we're going to be making more in the in the future. So. Yeah. Um, and having a more formal experience study will be clearly yeah. part of that. Well, I think that there's a consensus that uh, there's a problem here. Um, and I want to express my gratitude to the city for acknowledging the, the problem and uh, commitment to doing what you all can to, um, to help fix it. Um, I would encourage the board to avail yourselves to uh, the resources provided by the Pension <coughs> Review Board and others. Uh, we'd be happy to help you um, in any way possible. Um, and obviously, uh, there's, there are some concerns regarding the investment expenses, but that is the issue and the source of the problem is not limited to investment expenses. There are a lot, a lot of uh, factors going into this problem. Um, and my sense is that we've got a consensus that something needs to change. Mm -hmm. Everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mr. Yes. Rubre. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I'm not trying to cut cut it short, or wrap, but it's since I sense a little uh, wrap up, and I, I had two closing oh, things, <laughs> if if I could. 
one, I think we all work better under deadlines. So is there some specific goals or a timeline you want us to do something and get it back to the executive director? And two, uh, we want to thank the executive director and her staff. Uh, and we, we do want to reach out and use them as a resource uh, as well and work through this. So uh, not to cut y'all off, but no, I just no, not not sense the wrap up. Um, thank you for those questions. And on a staff level, we really appreciate the, the response that both the fund as well as the city provided. Just to reiterate, members, they've outlined concrete steps that they uh, are going to consider as they address uh, and work through some of these uh, funding challenges. Um, our goal is to include these reviews in, in our biennial report, which we publish uh, towards the end of November. Um, uh, every uh, other year, every even numbered year. Um, and so we will be including all the reviews that we are doing in the biennial report, in, including orange fires uh, for the legislature. Um, and we have informed the systems that if, if they're working towards a goal, if they're working towards a solution, they can provide updates to us and we will make sure we share those updates with the legislature uh, next session. So to that end, uh, we would encourage uh, all parties uh, to communicate with the staff, uh, particularly between now and the end of November, when that report is uh, going to be conveyed to the legislation. Is there any other requirement regarding their funded, uh, their FSRP? The fund has provided a revised FSRP to, uh, the fund and the city have provided a joint revised FSRP to us. Um, and we will be monitoring the progress uh, of that plan. And, and, I, and, I would, and I would suspect that that will be revised again as these discussions continue with the board or board and the members to try to make some, uh, some re revisions. So. Thank you. And if you could keep in mind the uh, November deadline with regard to that, that would be helpful. And that Absolutely. November deadline may prove helpful uh, with regard to uh, discussions among the different parties. Perfect. And, and even, just to add on that, Keith, uh, even uh, updates post the, the publication of the biennial, we would appreciate that and make sure to communicate to the legislature, given we understand these uh, issues take time to resolve. So uh, any progress that you all are making, uh, if you could keep us in the loop, we will appreciate that and pass on to appropriate <coughs> entities. Yeah, and as it's passed on to staff, the staff passes it on to this committee and the full board, and so we appreciate knowing what's uh, the developments that are going on. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Chairman and Commission. I'd like to ask the PRB staff actuary, Kenny Herbold, to share any additional thoughts that he has on the uh, Orange Firefighter Plan. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, I was beginning to think that I might get out of actually talking today, so <laughs> I guess that's not the case. I don't think I have anything specific to add um, for Orange Fire. I think you guys covered everything um, that, uh, that we did in... Um, in the review, I will say that we, you know, we did certainly recommend that uh, they perform a peer group study on their investments, and make sure that uh, you know that, that they're getting the best bang for their bucks. So uh, hopefully that. Uh, uh, it, and, and then in their response, they certainly um, acknowledged that, said that they were going to be looking into those. Uh, so I believe that uh, things are definitely moving in the right direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions for the staff actuary. If not, I would entertain a motion to direct staff to finalize the draft intensive review of the Orange Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. Um, and were there any changes that we agreed to make to that enough? Um, I don't recall any changes. Did I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't hear any specific changes to the report. Okay, so I would entertain a motion to uh, uh, pass on the approval and pass on the report as presented. So moved. Second. The moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It passes. Thank you. 
Um, and Kenny, if you would, please introduce us to the uh, intensive review of the Longview Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. Uh, certainly. So I want to give a quick um, refresher or reminder of the structure a little bit. Um, and sometimes the, uh, you know, note that sometimes the, the, the draft that goes out to the plan and the response that we receive, if it has page numbers, might be off a little bit because not everything is always included. So you'll notice that the long view response, I didn't actually include an executive summary. So their page numbers are referring typically to one later. So I'm, I'm sure you guys have, have recognized that, but I just wanted to point it out. Thank you. Uh, in, in the background section, um, we have included uh, uh, historical information, and this is based on the information that we have at the time <coughs> that the plan is selected for review. Uh, so this is this is essentially an explanation of this is why we're taking a look at it. Uh, you will note that the plan profile has the most recent up-to-date information. All of our analysis and uh, all of our projections include uh, any additional information that we've received after the fact. So uh, all of the analysis includes um, 1231-2017 uh, information, uh, which is the most recent information that we have. So um, I'll, I'll move on to uh, the first section of the report, which is our funding risk section. Uh, we tend to start this um, section with the graph that's shown on uh, page four, which is uh, sources of change in the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, this one happens to have a few more pieces. Uh, if you go back to the orange, uh, you'll notice that it primarily includes the first two columns and then in other, uh, generally speaking, what we've found uh, with a lot of our plans is uh, the investment return is uh, a, a big issue and the contributions are not sufficient to cover normal costs plus interest on the unfunded. And that generally covers a good portion of um, how the unfunded has grown. Um, so this one does include uh, a, a bit more piece, uh, a few more pieces. Uh, part of that's because of the, uh, the quality of the reports. We were able to actually identify everything and the sources of all the changes, uh, so that's uh, helpful. Uh, we don't have to do any of the calculations ourselves. We can just verify that, uh, that that's where these are coming from. And so we were able to lay this out a little bit more, uh, but also because one um, new item that we start with in this is, is kind of different than, than what we've discussed in the past. So I do want to talk a little bit more about this particular graph and what these items are, uh, just to give uh, some background on, on what we're looking at. So. Again, the first uh, bar in this graph is uh, differences in actual rate of return versus assumed rate of return. So this is a, a unexpected changes in the unfunded accrued liability. So if assets don't grow as quickly as we expect, then we're going to see a loss here. And so we're going to see a, a bar above uh, the x, um, x axis. Uh, the second item really is kind of expected changes in the unfunded because we know what the contributions are going to be. We know what the normal cost is expected to be, what the interest is expected to be. So this is not unexpected. It's just a function of what uh, the funding policy actually is, what the contribution rate is. The third column, uh, this is essentially, uh, these are unexpected gains or losses that are occurring strictly on the, on the liability. So this is basically a function of the assumptions we make about the expected benefit payment stream, uh, so it includes you know mortality, uh, individual salary increases. This doesn't include uh, the payroll growth rate necessarily. It's uh, it's really a function of our individual salaries growing the way we expect or not. Uh, how you know retirement rates, how things are going. Um, so this one uh, typically is a much smaller percentage of uh, the unfunded accrued liability changes. And again, it is unexpected changes. And then the final two uh, represent uh, any benefit changes that are made to the plan and then any changes that are made to the assumptions as well as methods that we might uh, look at. So if we change the, the way the assets are valued or something like that. Uh, so again, uh, the item that is uh, unusual in this particular case is the third bar, which is the liability experience. Uh, you'll notice that uh, it's a 16 million, uh, nearly 50% of the change over what, um, and this is a 12 year period, we're looking at um, the very beginning of 2006 to the very end of 2017. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's unusual for that to occur because basically what we, we don't expect um, the liability changes to exactly match our assumptions in any given year, but we do expect gain, both gains and losses over time. If we don't see uh, both gains and losses, um, particularly if we trend in one direction, we would expect uh, assumptions to be changed in order to better match plan experience and what we expect to occur going forward. So what experience has led to this loss? 
uh, I don't have uh, the specific details. Um, it, what what is presented in the reports is uh, strictly this is the expected change in the liability, and this is where we are now. So all I can look at is uh, aggregate changes. I can't explain uh, the specific pieces that, that led to this. Thank you. I, I think it is important to comment that the 16 million investment return loss on a base of 43 million dollars in assets is you know what 37 percent of the asset current value and that the 16 and a half million dollar experience loss is like 18 percent of the current liability I mean that's those are very significant accumulated losses absolutely and, and we, we do talk about the um, uh, investment return uh, a little bit later in the report but given that this is a uh, uh, different than we had, you know, than we typically see. Uh, we thought it was is worth uh, bringing forward a little bit and, and having that discussion. So, generally speaking, what happens is, uh, you know, a, a plan performs a experience study and looks at the individual assumptions to determine whether they have been uh, changing in the way that you expect and if uh, assumptions need to change. And in this particular case, that certainly happened. You know, the the, the plan performed an experience study that looked at individual assumptions. And, uh, but the result um, was, uh, based on the uh, information that I have available to me, a little bit surprising because individual assumptions were changed that resulted in an additional gain on their liability, meaning instead of the liability, the, they were, the liability was increasing more than expected over the past however many years. They looked at the assumptions and they said that we need to make some changes, but resulted instead of the liability going up more, the liability dropped. So. On the surface, that would, you know, when you're looking at individual assumptions, maybe that seems reasonable. But part of this analysis typically should include uh, looking at what happens in the aggregate. And you are supposed to examine the impact of any aggregate or any changes of individual assumptions on the aggregate liability. So in this particular case, they had experienced a number of years of uh, liability losses made some changes specifically to the liability assumptions that resulted in the gain. So on an aggregate basis, uh, the assumptions seemed um, unusual and p potentially not reasonable. So, Kenny, did the, the loss, the $16.5 million, was that in a year or two or three uh, was, years, uh, or is it consistently? Over, it was uh, over a 12-year period, so they had, um, I think it was uh, Almost annual valuations over uh, the period 1231-2015 to 1231-2017, and so over that period of time, every valuation except for one resulted in an experience loss on their liability. And so, the, when they did the experience study, they looked at a five-year period. Uh, they didn't look at that entire period. They looked at a five-year period, but again, they don't have valuations lining up specifically with that five-year period, but. It's, they're still experiencing uh, over that period. The period, the valuations that contain that period, all had uh, liability losses as well. So, one of the recommendations we were making was that perhaps they should have an actuarial audit. You know, it is for larger plans; it's a requirement to occur once every five years. Uh, the, this plan is not uh, large enough to meet the legal requirement, but it's certainly a, a good uh, practice to have uh, outside eyes come in and take a look at things. Uh, every once in a while. We don't have the uh, access to the data uh, to do uh, an in-depth review ourselves. All we can do is, is look at what's uh, provided to us uh, publicly and then do a, you know our analysis on that way. But Was there a change in actuary during this period? I would have to go back and look. Uh, during that 12-year period, there certainly was, yeah. but, but I don't think... Um, <clears throat> You know, I think since two, I think yeah. 2009 was when the experience, 2009 to 2015 was the, the period of time that the experience was looked at. Um, I think the uh, same actuary, and the same actuary for the majority of that time. Before we have more questions, do you have more prepared remarks? I have, I have a few more, yes. Okay, please. Can, okay. Can we ask just one question on this specific topic? I'm yeah. sure, please. This is super interesting for everybody, so. Um, I just have a just a clarification. So there was an experience study done. My understanding was that was 2016, which resulted in given past, uh, past the recent past plan experience uh, should have been liabilities going up, but liabilities went down. Uh, do we have uh, a, a CAFR or valuation report that happened in the subsequent year? 
We do, yes. Uh, and what happened? Was there a liability loss that, uh, uh, there loss was that a, year? A liability loss that um, was slightly more than the gain that they um, achieved by the changes in the assumptions. So in other words, they lowered liabilities in one year and then experienced a liability loss uh, that is, fits the pattern in the subsequent year on their annual report yes. that was larger than their reduction in liabilities by looking at assumptions. Correct. Great. Thank you. Please proceed. Uh, sure. So, uh, again, we, you know, we recommended that uh, perhaps they, they have a, an actuarial audit come in and look at um, at the assumptions and look at the valuations uh, as part of uh, this because it is a an unusual uh, thing for us to to see in in these reviews. Um, so, in addition to that, uh, you know, we are seeing very similar. Um, results in investment returns. So just like we have seen with, with Orange Fire and many of the other uh, reviews we've done, their 10-year annualized returns uh, uh, over a number of years uh, are not uh, it, it meeting or exceeding their assumed rate of return. Uh, so we, we spent a little bit of time uh, discussing that. And one item uh, that we did note, and this is also based on you know, conversations we had with the plan, is that they have had um, rather large allocation to illiquid investments uh, in the recent past. Now, we want to um, you know, give uh, credit where credit is due. The, the plan certainly recognized that um, these particular investments may not be appropriate for uh, the plan. Uh, they are in the process of, um, they're, they're primarily in the drawdown period at this point, so they're in the process of moving away from those, but obviously they don't want to sell them at a loss, so they're waiting to achieve the expected returns, and as these investments um, mature, they'll be selling them off and lowering their target allocation. Like right now, you know, their maximum allocation is 35%, but that's uh, partially uh, to allow for the expected growth in these investments. And then as they sell them off, they're, they're planning on moving their, um, their target allocation in, in alternative investments down closer to a 10% range. Sorry, let me uh, take a quick look at my notes again to, to get my spot. So also, you know, again, uh, the uh, Longview Fire Plan is a, is a Telfer plan. They do have a similar contribution structure as most uh, Telfer plans. They've got a fixed rate contribution. Obviously, we've discussed today some, some concerns with that particular approach. And one of those is your ability to react to uh, potential adverse uh, uh, situations again, you know, I think we've we've found that um, w with Longview, uh, they ha they seem to have a pretty good relationship with their uh, uh, with their plan sponsor. Uh, and actually, in 2012, uh, they started implementing a plan, a multi-step plan to raise contributions and put themselves on a a better footing. Um, and and they have been raising contributions over the past uh, six years. Um, but you know, we can see that. Um, their funded ratio really hasn't been improving. You know, the contributions are going up, but the funded ratio has remained relatively stagnant. Uh, I believe it, it's actually gone down from the low 50s when they implemented started implementing this plan down to about 45 percent right now. So it, it's a good illustration of the difficulty uh, associated with reacting to two issues, um, the difficulty associated with making steps in the right direction um, with this particular approach to uh, to funding. So it, it's it's they've certainly been uh, attempting to make steps, but sometimes those steps uh, are more difficult and bigger that, than than what is actually being um, being taken. So we do um, one of one of the recommendations we're making in, in uh, associated with that is that they create a funding policy that focuses on uh, achieving full funding and that has a little bit more flexibility than a uh, a fixed rate contribution and I'll talk a little bit more about that as uh, I move into the governance uh, section as well and so I did uh, you know already mentioned that um, they've been working well with their city uh, so from a governance perspective you know the issues that are raised um, with respect to tougher plans in particular uh, as not necessarily being able to you know if there's certain concerns or they are adver have an adversarial relationship with their plan sponsor sometimes things don't uh, um, you can't make any decisions. Uh, in this particular case, again, they seem to have a very good rela working relationship. Uh, so, you know, that's that's definitely a positive from that perspective. Uh, but one of the things, so one of the things we did uh, want to bring up, though, is uh, their investment policy statement. Um, they had a uh, 
uh, an investment policy statement that included a, a number of um, <coughs> items that are recommended as best practice by uh, the GFOA, the, uh, excuse me, the, um, the, the actual name is, is uh, escaping me at the moment. Government the Finance Academy. Officer Association. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so they had it, the, but they found that, that the, the primary structure of this was extremely cumbersome because whatever they had associated with it required them to, to amend their investment policy statement every time they made any type of change. So they attempted to um, pare down the investment policy statement, but what we found was that they basically stripped it of almost all of the recommended practices that were included in the prior uh, investment policy statement. So from that, we're basically recommending that they reconsider adding some of those back in without adding in the requirement, the what they found cumbersome and the requirement to amend the investment policy statement. So investment policy statement is intended to guide decisions. It's not intended to hinder decisions. And so if you are having to amend your IPS every single time you make a decision, that's going to be it's going to prevent you from really wanting to do anything with it. So there are ways to structure an IPS that includes a number of best practices without hindering your, um, your decision. So uh, the recommendation that came from that was simply to reconsider how, you, how it's structured and, and adding some things back in. Thank you. Is that all? That's, that's, yeah, I think that's everything for now. Thank you. I have been advised by staff that I uh, failed to call the roll at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, and lest anybody find this meeting to be uh, a non-event, I would like to ask staff to please call the roll. I see a quorum is present, and uh, let's validate that, please. Chair Keith Brainer. Here. Marsha Desch. Here. Josh McGee. Present. Okay, quorum is present. Thank you, and sorry about that. Kenny, thank you. And uh, I'd, I'd like to ask representatives of the uh, Longview Fund to uh, please come forward. And members, just a quick note here. As part of their four-step plan uh, to increase contributions since 2012, um, the city is expected to increase their contribution in October of this year. And uh, with these contribution increases, it has helped the amortization period of the plan to go down to 40 years. Thank you. And welcome. Would you be nice enough to uh, introduce yourselves? And you've already done it, so you don't have to do it again. Um, if you would, please. Hi, I'm Angela Cohen. I'm with the City of Longview. I am the Finance Director. Colby Beckham. I'm the Chairman of the Fire Pension Fund. Charles Smith with Robert Harrell Incorporated. We're the Investment Consultant. Thank you and welcome. Um, do, do any of you have uh, any prepared remarks or things you'd like to say in response to uh, what's been presented to the committee? Yes, sir. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to come down here and represent our, our pension fund. And I, I think what I want to highlight the most is the difference of the situation that's happening in Longview, Texas versus what we've seen played out uh, before. Uh, I, I think a good relationship is an understatement of what we have with the city. Um, I, I consider our pension fund to almost be a leader uh, amongst others that recognized the uh, downfall that uh, was occurring and that uh, waiting out for time to heal the wounds was not going to work. So in 2011, uh, we engaged with the city to come up with a plan to start recognizing those, those losses, those underfunding issues and take the steps to move forward. And they were very uh, responsive in the situation. I'll, 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 uh, Brian Jones is the vice chair sitting behind me. I'm going to use one of his uh, famous statements is, partners pay half. And, and that's exactly the approach we went. Uh, uh, oftentimes, I think cities and, and uh, funds get caught up in a blame game of why things are where they're at. And, and we, we chose not to go down that road. And uh, we were very fortunate uh, uh, to have a city and a city manager uh, at that time that was very responsive to it. And we sat down, we engaged with uh, our uh, actuary, uh, Foster and Foster, and uh, performed some special experience studies to identify what changes could be made uh, to do that. And uh, they, they were actually a very valuable asset in the sense that uh, uh, being based out of Florida and representing plans across the country, we know what other Telfer plans do, we know what other state plans do, but we're not always uh, engaged with what other ideas uh, might be out there. So we uh, 
leaned on him for some advice of maybe some levers we, we hadn't identified and uh, he mentioned the spouse annuity earlier in Orange and that's actually one of the changes that we've made. And uh, next month we'll complete uh, that four-step plan which includes a 6% increase in contributions uh, between the employees and city, uh, a, a modification of uh, final average salary to the tier one employees, um, a tier two was put into place effective uh, beginning 2016 which included a 25% cut uh, to uh, benefits and a 5% or five-year age increase to benefits for those tier two employees uh, moving forward. Uh, and also, like we, we stated, the, the change of the uh, spouse to an annuity style uh, uh, benefit there. Uh, so our relationship between the city and the fund, I think, are great. We're not a collective bargaining city, so we don't have the association. With it. There's not a uh, contract that plays into our situation. Uh, when, when we do that, uh, we follow the uh, Telfer statute and we go to our membership and uh, take care of that. Uh, in regards to, I've heard the, the governance comment come up quite a bit about the Telfer statute. Um, in, in our situation, it works. We have an active board, two citizen board members, uh, one of them who just uh, got off the board only because he went to work for the city and he couldn't hold that position, had 32 years on the board. Um, our citizens, uh, board members are very active. Our city board members are very active. Our fire board members are very active. So it, it's quite common to see all seven parties, seven people from all three parties represented and, and that governance moving forward. So we, we feel like we're not leaving any stakeholder out of the decisions because of the activity of the board. It, it, if, if it was a different situation where either the firemen uh, weren't active or the city wasn't active, I could see there could be a liability there. But the model does work uh, when applied in, in the correct uh, 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 setting. I think if you do look at the report, although uh, there are some uh, uh, negative lights that were shined on there, uh, a fair view of everything we've done shows progress. We went from infinity uh, and our lowest point before we changed some assumptions were at 37.3 years and, and uh, I applaud the, the firemen that were willing to make the hard changes that they were. Uh, I applaud the city for making the changes and the board as a whole for working towards that goal. And some of those, like our, our second tier, obviously take time to uh, 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 show up uh, along the way. If there's any downfall, it's been investment performance. I mean, just a cut and dry investment performance uh, has been below what uh, we would uh, desire to be. Um, I'm trying to hit all the highlights, so cut me <laughs> off if I get anywhere. I, I, I've been gathering uh, what I think y'all were looking for. Uh, we, we have looked at our assumed rate of return, uh, return and that has been, uh, if, if you have a copy of that uh, uh, actuarial experience study, it was presented in there an idea of going down to 7.75%. And uh, uh, that, that is on our radar. I think we're going to take more of a ratcheting as we get that positive experience, drag it down as much as we can uh, uh, to a, a more reasonable number of where we're at. So we do recognize the 8% uh, uh, is a number that we want to address in the future uh, to uh, get those uh, assumptions in line. Um, and beyond that, uh, let's see. Uh, we, we've made several changes, uh, annual evaluations. We have gone to annual evaluations to see where we're at on there. Uh, the IPS was brought up at the end there. Uh, we felt like our last in investment policy statement was being driven by the investment and it wasn't driving the investment. And that's why we felt when we changed consultants, uh, we addressed that concern with him. So uh, two years ago, we changed our investment consultants. And uh, since then, we've had a very positive uh, uh, return uh, for that period. Uh, I believe we included a, a graph that shows some of the alternatives that were unfortunately uh, all in the drawdown years, which were uh, also negatively affecting the returns that are starting to hit that J curve, not all of them. But we, we have uh, positive hope in the future to, to see that return over the long 10-year period uh, play out to be a, a, a much better uh, uh, return to that 10-year number looking forward, but of course, until we hit that day, it's impossible to say. And I'll shut up so y'all can talk to me. <laughs> Thank you. No, we, we appreciate that. We, we appreciate your willingness to come down, and I want to to recognize and commend the the uh, um, what appears to be a solid governance arrangement. There, we don't hear that every time around here. 
uh, and we appreciate the knowing that the uh, city and the plan are working closely together and recognize the uh, the challenge that you have. Uh, also, we don't always hear about uh, the um, uh, willingness of active members to take benefit cuts, and uh, want to commend them for that as well. And um, could you one th one issue that uh, staff brought up was the uh, liability experience that's worse than assumed. Although we don't have details on that, uh, do any of you have? Uh, uh, insight into that, Mr. Heinrichs. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, that is a material issue here affecting this plan. Yes. Um, so, so just like with all of our clients, every five years we like to do an experience study, and and um, and just to give you, just to give the board some background, I think we started working with Longview in 2012. 2012. So it's been a little while. Um, and, and uh, one of the first things we did was when we assessed the situation, we, 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 we had some really hard talks with the board um, and spent quite a bit of time in Longview. I hadn't spent much time in Longview. I got to, I got to, I got to see, it, see it all, I think. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we made some benefit changes and had to, we had those same discussions I was just talking to, that we're gonna be having with Orange firefighters um, over the course of a few days. Um, and, and educating the members, that 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 happened. They made some changes. Um, we're we're uh, we're down the road from some of those changes. There may be more changes that need to be that, that certainly need to be made. But I will tell you this, and I think you can probably gather that just by listening to to, to Colby's comments. Um, it's a very active group. He didn't mention that these guys are going to to conferences all over the the, the state and, and and country to, to become better educated as trustees. Um, uh, the, the, they're always asking questions, tough questions. Mr. Um, Smith, what what caused this sixteen million dollar uh, loss in liabilities relative to uh, expectations? Well, so so in our experience study, we show that that um, that that. Some of their some of their performance, especially with when we're talking about um, salary increases, uh, were higher than expected. Some of that can be attributable to to um, certain one-time events that have happened. Um, the the turnover uh, was was less than expected. Do you have um, an attribution analysis? Have you we we, we we have well in the in the we we have not. Like for example, in his in his in his report, he went back from 2006 to 2017. Our experience study covered a different time period. It was a five-year time period, in the middle of all of that. Um, and and just to give you sort of the Paul Harvey rest of the story as it pertains to that experience study, um, the well, the, and, the, and the board uh, agreed to make all sorts of changes um, to the assumptions there. Sands the lowering the assumed rate, which we also measured. Um, the unfunded liability did go down slightly in that result, but the normal cost went up significantly. And so the result was that the amortization period, which is kind of what what a lot of folks use to to view the health, and you guys use to view the health of or the financial um, uh, the financial health of the plan, went up um, by a couple of years. And and uh, at seven and three quarters, it would have gone up um, substantially more more years in terms of uh, the amortization period. So, so as a result of the study, um, the the relative funding position, um, looking at the amortization period, worsened as you might expect, and that's really what happened. That's it. So it was the unfunded liability is one piece, the normal cost is another, and so the normal cost was was elevated. The unfunded went down a little bit. Um, I'll also mention because I think it was asked. Uh, uh, by my trustee McGee um, was that uh, you know was there a valuation done subsequent and how did it how did it, yes there was a there was a liability loss of 1.7 million dollars on 94 million dollars so it's not like we're talking about some enormous thing and then in the aggregate the the experience was 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 neutral I think we had a fifty thousand dollar loss on you know, a hundred something million dollars in liabilities and almost fifty million in assets. So we're, we're going to thank you. Fifty thousand is very. It's very much a. We, we had a very neutral year. Thank um, you for that. If you have not already, would you be nice enough to share that information with the staff? The people. Of course. Staff? Yeah. Of course. Thank yeah. You. And qu questions. I do have another question. Sure. Um, so I know that this 
this plan is not subject to the state law requirement requiring an audit. Is that correct? Yes. Um, as part of, of the experience study, did you do any um, benchmarking uh, calculations or do you do benefit certifications for actual calculations that the plan does? Um, yeah, asking like so when a firefighter retires, do we, do we, yeah. um, we have not done that. No, yeah. we haven't. Now, the, the, the it, it, their plan is, is different than some of the other plans that maybe you and I have worked on over, over our careers and that they don't have 10 different optional forms of payment to choose from. So, so it's not as if there's a lot of actuarial work done with the calculations. So, um, but no, we have not. We have not. Uh, I don't believe, unless I'm. No, I, I, no unless it's happened, and, and I didn't know it. But I, I, as I sat here and I, I, you know, tried to think how something like this could happen, and and the only thing that I could come up with was if you looked at the an actual benefit calculation. There might be something going on with respect to how pay is treated in the actual calculation that might be different. You know, you've said you've said that we believe we're valuing the plan as it's written. Yeah. But but there could be some some variance in in how pay or service, you know, maybe service adjustments are made for unpaid uh, vacation or something like that, but but something to me would say if, if the rates look good, you know, my, if, if I think my termination rates and my retirement rates are good, something else is happening. And so I, I would suggest maybe just doing some spot checking on benefits we're, to And make we're happy sure. to do that. For, for probably 95% of our clients, we actually do the benefit calculations. In this case, I think that the, the board, probably before we came around, made a decision that they were going to do their calculations in house. Um, you know, it's something we're, we're certainly happy to certainly happy to do. I, I just think that might be worthwhile. I, I, I'm just searching for a reason. Well, for could, it. Could, could I interject you know, on that? That yeah. uh, part of our yearly audit, they review our uh, uh, retirement cal calculations. Not all of them, but spot check benefit yeah. calculations along the way, and uh, we have a two two layer platform. We have a an online version of a benefit uh, form that is followed up by an administrator manual backup form to verify uh, benefits before they're paid. Yeah. So then there's there's you are having an audit, so that probably is nothing there. But I'm just wondering if maybe that's the only missing piece yeah. that. And, you and, know, and we would between just, the plan administrator and the sure, actuary. Sure, certainly welcome to do that. It's a good and it's a good thought. And 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 as you you were consulting, we welcome an actuary. We have no problems with yeah. with with them doing some. If they want to spend the money to do that, that's perfectly fine by us, because um, it happens in other places. Um, but uh, <coughs> you know, we set. The, we, we talked with the board about what we expect the experience to be based upon what we've seen and, and um, you know the loss that we had this year didn't wasn't alarming really it's, it was you, you have some fluctu you have general fluctuations and the loss that we had on demographics this year wasn't huge um, but so, you, you tend to have a loss every year yeah. it would be nice well, if not, you saw some gains and losses just to continue it's on that point the loss this year would not be alarming if it wasn't part of a broader trend I mean what's but we, but we did change. Me, we did change the assumptions for this year, though. So it's I not, mean, what's alarming is we're at forty six point zero. When I saw this graph, I mean, I put a star, big star, beside the yeah. the liability loss. I mean, that is really surprising. And I said, what in the world's going on? And you know, board chair, I'm guessing you're doing the same thing. I love the commitment. Uh, to trying to figure out a solution, uh, but it's pretty obvious like where the problems are. You said investment returns. There's this other where you're just consistently undershooting cost uh, in the valuation, and you could you could work together great and do some uh, fantastic work, and members could be committed. But if we don't fix those two issues, the the trend doesn't get fixed. And so we got to get this thing going in the right direction. I think that Marsha is trying to think of. What could be driving it? Yeah, I mean, if you do an experience study and you, you, you know, you kind of you do tweak the assumptions, but nothing looks bad, then I'm looking for something else. Mm -hmm. And is there something missing between how benefits actually get calculated and what the actuary thinks 
health benefits could be calculated. And, and we and do have we do have retirement losses. We've had termination losses. Um, you know, we also look at their their retirement rates and termination rates, not just relative to their own experience, but the experience that we have for other 300 plus public funds and public safety funds across the country. And 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 so you have to weigh as the actuary. You kind of have to, as yeah. you know, you have to you have to weigh. Okay, this is what's happened. But this is what, if you were to look at the broader experience of public safety firefighters across the country, this is this is the average. Do we go? Do we, do we? Yeah. You know, where, where do we go? And and um, and and so there's going to be some of that. Some in, credibility. In, in, credibility, exactly. And and so. Uh, and and just like investments, past performance doesn't exactly. necessarily predict future performance, and so you take and, that into account. And when, and when we talked about the assumed rate of return. Um, the you know I, I brought up the same chart that I think is in the is in the um, analysis that shows that gosh we're not we haven't been beat, we haven't been making it and I said well, what are we going to do um, the investment consultants you know it should be mentioned and it was in the experience study that that the the investment consultant provides a for for Gasby purposes provides a, a an, an expectation of by asset class what they expect over the long term. And, and in this case, uh, the, the expected rate of re real rate of return was 6.07 before inflation. Um, we didn't come up with that. That's the investment consultant. And so what we said to them was, just what we said to the board was, okay, this is what your investment consultant says. They're in charge of, well, they're, they have a large say in, in your portfolio along with you guys. Um, so according to what they're saying, there's some support there for 8%. Historical results would not support eight percent um, and I said I think that you need to have some hard discussions or 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 make some kind of changes and what did they do they actually went out and made some change made some investment changes they, they changed the professional uh, firm that they use they the uh, so just to I, I think that um, I think it's I, I really applaud that you guys are working together I don't think that's and I, I don't think that uh, neither myself nor Marcia nor Keith are trying to assign blame no. here. We're looking at numbers where we've got a good situation between the fund and the city. Yep. Uh, we've got some positive action taking place, um, uh, and that's to be applauded, but we're seeing a deterioration in funded status that is really alarming. Um, and I think that there, uh, and there are a couple of drivers here that are, you know, of the 50 million in underfunding, 32 of it uh, is recent and between underperformance on investments and this uh, this liability loss side. And so, regardless of how we arrived at um, kind of the assumptions that we've got, we've really got to. We're just saying question mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, whether those models that we've used to set those assumptions and uh, are correct for uh, this particular circumstance. It may just be that looking at experience for the 300 plus plans that you use uh, and past performance for Longview isn't hitting the mark, and we need to question that. And it's not. And we saying, do. And so. But we're continuing to see liability losses. So I would just say that you know that's another continued conversation that needs to happen and I would focus on those two areas um, the investment returns uh, so switching to the investment returns I don't know I don't have a whole lot more to say on the no. liability side other than that's outside the norm for public plans whenever we do this kind of analysis it's outside the norm from what I've seen uh, it's surprising to me to see evaluation change of assumptions go the opposite direction given recent experience uh, on li consistent liability losses and then to see a liability loss in the year immediately following those assumption changes uh, that leads me to believe that there's not quite enough questioning going on around assumptions investment side um, Again, this is a place where I understand you've made some changes. Uh, I agree that the alternative allocation is probably too high, uh, especially for a plan of your size. Um, and it's really hard to kind of get under the hood and understand what's going on there, even for uh, really experienced people. And it's just a, it, it's, it's a large allocation. The plan is underperforming there. Um, and so I, I um, really appreciate the steps you've taken uh, to address that. Um, I don't expect uh, you've shown a graph here where you've jumped back up to, you know, eight or ten percent in the last couple of years. Um, I would just caution that I wouldn't use that as justification to keep your investment rate of return high. Um, I would. I am worried looking at the sources of change that um, that. 
you guys are working together and you're aiming at a target, but that target is too low in terms of funding going into the plan to secure benefits. Um, and I, I think that even if you have a good working relationship, that's going to put a lot of strain on that relationship and it's going to put a lot of strain on the plan if we continue to see funded status going down. And so I would encourage you um, to really take a hard look at that investment rate of return too, uh, especially uh, uh, trying to ratchet it down in future years. Try to get there slowly if you have to, but 8% is uh, outside the norm for public plans right now. Uh, it's outside of uh, any uh, market projections that I've seen. Um, the, you could probably get there in terms of a, a median projected rate of return, but you would have to be outside the norm for risk for a plan. Uh, and so just really question that as well. I, I have Charles here. He uh, represents our, uh, our consultants that have taken over, and he, I think, has some graphs to, to show the changes that we have made and, and the diversification, and I, I just invited him to... To sure. on that. Mr. Smith, what firm are you with, please? Uh, Robert Harrell Incorporated. Thank you. Yes, we're also uh, here in Austin. And and, and thank you all uh, for having me. Um, you do have the exhibits that... Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I guess this first exhibit here uh, is just showing uh, throughout time on a seven-year time horizon um, how our, our returns ha have improved. We've been with the firm, um, excuse me, our firm has been with Longview since January 1st, 2017, so we're relatively new. And you can see here, whenever we enacted change, uh, it was around April, yeah. I, I believe, when we, we had everything done. And you, and you can see the, uh, the increase in performance, you know, as far as the drag down and then that um, inflection point there showing, um, you know, the positive results. Um, also, on the second page, we have um, a peer review. Um, and this shows um, Longview ranked among their peers, meaning um, it's a Lipper mixed asset allocation, uh, we'll, we'll say target moderate, which, that, which what that means is they're professionally uh, managed funds that are balanced and their equity range are between 40 and 60%. So we put Longview within that peer, within those peers. And also you can see also within one to two years, um, say we're within the fourth percentile on the one year and 11th on the two year. And then you see the underperformance starting at the three year going back um, on the seven year, which is our um, <clears throat> first point of reference at 98th percentile, meaning the whenever we're looking at that, uh, 100 is the worst and one is the best, excuse me. So things have improved markedly since you showed up? Yes, sir. <laughs> that's, what <we're> trying, <laughs> that's what we're trying to put out there. What'd you do? Uh, well, what we did was we diversified among <coughs> where we could among domestic equity and fixed income and also took out some higher fee active managers and replaced them with some lower cost index funds as well. Are you advising the fund on their uh, uh, investor return assumption? Are we advising on the... Uh, we give them information. We also do an annual study every year, and um, our return assumption, I think he said it was a little over 6%. Um, I think the last one that we ran was... Before inflation. Be, uh, before inflation, correct. And the last one we ran, I believe, was 7.44, which was the one we ran beginning of this year. Is that with or without inflation? Without. All right. Does that include... Is that by asset category, or are you including alpha for active management, or what? Well, we included, the way we run it is we run a 10-year time horizon on it, mm -hmm. and uh, we, and then usually what we get out of it is that expected, you know, return going forward and a standard deviation to which is how we measure the risk. You're, you're projecting a 744 return over 10 years for this fund net of inflation? Yes. Could you provide the the uh, backup for that? Sure, 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 sure. Yes, yes. That's you might you're probably aware that's well outside of what yes, uh, national everybody else is saying. Sure. Yeah, I, I will provide the study. Um, <clears throat> since you okay. Sure. Thank you. Can we uh, also staff? We all have access to capital market uh, projections. It might just be useful to based on what we know. Uh, We've done this before in these studies to include kind of just some uh, bounding ranges on what we're seeing. 
from the the rest of the folks who operate in this field and do capital market assumptions. That's that's surprisingly high. Uh, I mean, that's that's not just outside the bounds. It's it's surprisingly high. Sure, I perfectly understand. And the re and we did use ten years because we also wanted to to, to make sure that you know we're um, looking at two thousand eight and two thousand nine as well. I, I worry a little bit. Wait, um, wait, is that a forward-looking set of assumptions, or are you looking at actual performance over the last ten years? Well, we're using our current mix, yeah, and we're estimating. It's a forward-looking. It, forward it's forward-looking. Yes, right. it's, so it's a projection. It's a ten-year. Excuse me, I misspoke. Right? Yeah. Excuse me. No. Thank you. Okay. I worry there's there could be sorry Keith. Go ahead. Uh, that there there's a little bit of mix here, uh, and the board's just going to have to kind of weigh this. Where uh, if I'm an investment professional, I want to be able to say, look, I think I can deliver performance that's super awesome uh, compared to the rest of the field. Um, however, the um, whenever you go to set your return assumption, uh, it's really important uh, that you set that. Well, and I would argue conservatively, so that you are getting enough money in the plan to cover benefits costs. Uh, if you overshoot on the assumption, it's really hard to make up for those losses because you got to get more money from members of the city, and that's just hard to deal with. Uh, the The consequences of overshooting on your investment rate of return, I think, are bigger than the consequences of undershooting by a, a little bit. And so, I would just, uh, I would hesitate to use the forward-looking projections from an investment consultant that clearly uh, is outside the bounds of what we've seen on um, capital market projections and understandably is trying to uh, keep your business by showing strong performance to uh, set your investment rate of return, which is most important in terms of funding policy. Yeah. I, and again, I go back to the actual standards of practice, which is that an assumption should not include bias it should it should be your expectation you know neither neither overly conservative or overly aggressive and so and, and again shouldn't necessarily take into account any alpha for active management but but it also should um, defer to professionals who may have a a better uh, understanding than maybe we do as actuaries when it comes right. to to setting set assumption and 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 as for for this fund and the portfolio that the portfolio uh, managers that we've been talking to with the consultants have been I guess what we're what we're hearing here is that they have historically had very um, positive outlooks uh, for the experience uh, I, I so guess to set the board to rest none of that is affecting the f fact that we intend on ratcheting down is some great return. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> okay. Other, other uh, questions for the, uh, uh, the group? I'll just note um, it's it's not as extreme and is not uh, as big a point that I'd like to make here as with the with orange, uh, but the fees you're paying are above what I would say would be best practices, and that's just my opinion. You know, I, I like to see, so the median for public plans uh, for all-in fees is generally in the, you know, 50 basis point range. Uh, and this is uh, uh, above that. Uh, and so I would just keep an eye on the fees, try to squeeze out some of those fees. It's not, you know, usually alarm bells go off for me whenever fees are above 100 basis points. Uh, and uh, you're not quite there, but you're uh, closer to that than you are to what I use as kind of best practice. So I would, I would encourage you to just ask some questions around fees and try to squeeze that out. Sounds like you're probably going in that direction by adding some index funds and some other things, squeeze, squeezing down the percentage to, to um, alternatives. Uh, so you're to be commended for doing that. Keep that going. Yeah, and, and again, would, would the fee information that we have reflect the change to the uh, inve you know, passive investments for um, large cap? So it may have already come down. Yes, it, it has. Yes. Do you know what your all-in fees are right now? We've got 0.83 is what we're looking at, so 83 basis points. That's, yeah, that, that's pretty okay. accurate. Okay. Right. And, and like you stated, the alternatives, unfortunately, mm -hmm. are inflating that number. And until they mature without just cutting a loss by selling them on a secondary market, it would be... Uh, 
not the, beneficial to the plan. The alternatives portfolio, just quickly, can you say kind of what is is that mostly comprised of? Do you want to break sure. it down for me? Sure. Um, as far as alternatives go on, on the hedge fund side, um, it's comprised of two, which is right at 13.5% currently. And on the other alternative side, which is the private equity end of it, um, it's right at 10%. So um, that being 23%, I know Colby had said that they would ratchet down to about 10 once everything starts to mature. Um, on those funds, uh, so, you know, I looked at the returns jumping up and I, um, and given the alternatives portfolio, uh, you know, in my head, I just want to flag it that you should be asking how those alternatives were valued uh, whenever you look at return numbers jumping up. We've seen other plans have issues with valuations of alternatives, in particular Dallas Police and Fire. Sure. Um, and so just kind of dig into um, how those, al those alternatives can be difficult to value. And sometimes you can be relying on people who have an incentive not to give right. quite uh, adequate information on the value the market valuation of those. So I just dig in there a little is bit. Is the hedge fund a fund of funds or is it a? Yes, ma'am. They're both gl uh, global macro. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Final comments, questions, Mr. Smith. Uh, actually, uh, my concern is that I don't know that this report uh, accurately describes the efforts and the progress of the Longview Fire and the City of Longview. And I would like the opportunity to work with Anu and her staff to maybe include. I, I felt like we fell in the same cookie cutter as a lot of funds that had come through here and I don't fee feel like that mold is appropriate for the, the stage that we're at uh, and would appreciate the opportunity to work with the new and the staff on maybe bringing some more of the positive efforts and, and work that has been done by the board of the city. Absolutely. Uh, every experience I've had with the staff indicates that they are committed to uh, the full truth and transparency and I am certain that they will work in good faith with you to fairly reflect the situation they're in in uh, Longview. Thank you, sir. Just one point on that. So I, I completely agree with everything that Keith just said. Um, I think given that uh, the there are a couple of elements which likely aren't going to change. So fair assessment is the funded ratio has been coming down consistently and is very low. Uh, there have been there's been negative experience on the liability side and on the investment side that need to be addressed. So uh, while I think that there's acknowledgement, there's also going to be continued focus on the areas that need continued improvement. But you're to be commended for the progress. And hope you'll feel free to communicate with the uh, with the staff and and uh, we'll look forward to that. Uh, thank you. And I would entertain a motion to direct staff to uh, finalize with possible changes as discussed uh, the intensive review of the Long Beach Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It passes. <coughs> and uh, I would ask Anu to bring us up to date on the uh, issue of the Irving Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. Members, uh, it's just a quick update to let you know that we will be reviewing the Irving Fire Plan at the next board meeting on October 4th. Uh, we have not received their most recent valuation yet, uh, but it's our understanding that they are still working on a 2017 valuation. If we are able to receive uh, that report in time uh, of us completing this review ahead of the board meeting in October, we will certainly make uh, a good faith effort to include the information in the review. However, in the interest of time and given the members had expressed that, uh, that we should continue on with the review with the goal of including it in the biennial report, uh, we will be conducting the review for the October board meeting. Thank you. So we'll, we'll see that next month then. Uh, and similarly on the Marshall Fire Fund. Uh, with regards to the Marshall Fire Plan, the members, 
we already went through reviewing the plan uh, and the uh, report, report was presented at the June board meeting. Uh, since then, we have uh, issued a letter uh, upon request of the uh, of the members as well as the fund issued a letter to the city as well as a uh, copied the plan encouraging them to work together uh, also providing a copy of the report since the the city was uh, uh, was unable to attend the meeting we provided uh, a copy of the re uh, the review as well as uh, encouraged them to work together on uh, working on a plan to address their funding situation and we have included a copy of that letter in the meeting packet uh, of your binders. Yeah, that's behind 3B, I believe. That 3B. is correct. Looks like the letter is dated July 2nd. Have we see, received a reply from them or heard anything from? We have not. Uh, it was an informational letter uh, as well as outlining uh, what we did with the review and to provide a copy of the review to the city specifically. How far is Marshall from Longview? 25 miles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> um, on to item six, interim study topics, and we had one that the staff's been working on regarding asset pooling, and I think Anu can give us an update on that, please. Uh, thank you, members. Um, unfortunately, with the asset pooling paper, we are still working on uh, uh, on the draft. We we lost our investment consultant last month, so. Uh, we are just trying to uh, ask staff to uh, put in as much work as possible to get the draft done and ready for the October board meeting. So we have not been able to present a draft at this meeting as we expected and hoped to do. But we will have a draft at the next board meeting. The, the state pay structure does not uh, really cover some positions that uh, we, we just can't be competitive in some in some areas and I think that's one of them and we're every time we get somebody who's well qualified and gets a little experience I think we are prone to lose that that person thank you for that comment Keith yes um, on to uh, the other interim study which was funding policies for fixed rate plans uh, sorry Michelle Cranes would you talk to us about that, please? Deputy Director of the PRB. And actually, you're going to join her. Sorry. Welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon. So I had planned to give a very high uh, overview of what we plan to do with this study that the board, uh, of course, directed us to do and invite any feedback that committee members have and thank our uh, board actuary for already providing very val valuable feedback and in the outline stage. So our essential goal in approaching this interim study topic was that given declining funding levels since 2008, and the elimination of the Gatsby Arc. Um, we want to look at the role and establish the importance of having a funding policy for all pension plans, regardless of their contribution structure. Um, in Texas, of course, nearly 80% of our plans have a fixed rate contribution, uh, which is set on, on uh, something other than a, a rate determined by the actuary. And if we, as we've t heard much this morning, that requires a, a very strong funding policy to guide the plan and sponsor, <coughs> excuse me, uh, on action when that fixed contribution rate is no longer adequate. So, an operating uh, a definition or goal of funding policy that we are we are using in in the the paper is the idea that a plan be moving toward full funding, and how that's done, of course, is up to the plan and ideally its sponsor. But uh, that uh, a funding policy is a very beneficial way, of course, to do that. Um, our plan then for the paper after establishing the benefits of funding policies would be to really take a deep dive and try to assist plans and their sponsors by uh, 
combing through and, and parsing out possible components of a funding policy, looking at uh, models from Texas and around the country in terms of what are uh, types of, of elements that funding policies can have to do things such as you know um, establish funding priorities as well as lay out risk and cost sharing mechanisms, uh, limit contribution uh, decreases or deficits, and uh, describe, of course, um, how benefits uh, might need to be changed in, in times when, again, contribution is, is not uh, is not adequate. So um, the uh, idea then would be to give concrete examples of, of, of things that we have seen in our research of, of model funding policies from around the, the state and country. And uh, expect that a resultant recommendation would be to recommend that all funds adopt a, a funding policy, a strong one, regardless of their contribution structure. Thank you, Marcia. You helped work on this. Uh, any comments? Well, a, a couple. Um, I, I'd like to go back to a, a thought that I shared earlier today, which was um, I am. It goes to the governance issue and this confusion uh, sometimes about who who pays for what or whatever. Uh, and I just think that as a fiduciary to the plan, when you're looking at the boards who are who are operating these plans. They, they really need to have some uh, say in if, if they cannot get the contributions in, then as fiduciary to the plan, they have to ensure that the benefits can be paid. They, they have to be able to control benefits in somehow, or there has to be a, fun, a, a method that, that contributions and benefit levels have to be linked. So that's, that's one thing. Um, the other thing that, again, just kind of a random thought, which is that um, I would like to see as part of this information about how downgrades in, in bond ratings have affected the cost of debt for a municipality. I don't know if we've got Texas examples or whatever, but I'd rather see money going into the pension plan than having a community have to pay more to bondholders. You know, I'd rather keep bond ratings up so that, that the cost of debt isn't as high. And, and, you know, doing that, getting the money into the pension plan. Um, so those were kind of two additional thoughts. I, I had also thought this is a paper that's going to the legislature, so one of the things that I did ask, which was, you know, can we assume that when you prepare a paper like this and you're kind of jumping right into some pretty complex subjects about unfunded liabilities and amortization, can you assume that the reader is going to understand this? And, and I think what, what I heard is that there is some preliminary training that the staff does for the legislature to explain what is a normal cost, what is the present value of all future benefits, how do you determine an actual liability, how do you determine an unfunded, and, and things. So that, that as long as that training is handled elsewhere, then it doesn't need to be here. But I was concerned when I saw us kind of jumping right into it here. Thank you. And again, we appreciate the uh, um, contributions you've made to this, uh, to this study to this point. Thank you. Anything you want to add on, on that? I'll send some notes along to staff. I will just say that um, I, I like kind of looking around at other guidelines. I think um, I think there's value there. I'm, I don't often these what we see in funding policies is a hesitance to really tie hands um, and do what needs to be done to really kind of go fully where things need to go. I think it would be interesting to include in this report a look at. Uh, and, and actually, Keith, the organization you work for, I think, has done some of this. Uh, talk about the importance of getting the ADC for sustainability, uh, for funded status. Uh, just making it clear that that kind of the best indicator of sustainability for a plan is receiving the full ADC year in and year out, um, and and strongly linking those. I think it would be great to talk about. Uh, to the extent that we have good information on Texas, the um, the extent to which our plans have been receiving their ADC, and just make that point. I think we've got to drive home with the legislature the the not necessarily the particulars of the funding policy per se, but the importance of 
driving towards full ADC uh, on a year in year out basis uh, from these plan sponsors. Is there anything in Texas that prohibits um, an actual valuation from setting for setting a contribution level, say two years out? Because it seems like there's a an issue that keeps coming up about budgeting, and I mean, could you have a you know January one eighteen valuation, and that is the basis for determining the contribution on an ADC basis for? 2020, either with some adjustments or roll forwards or whatever, but but they, could, you know, that could be one way to avoid a budgeting issue if you could set it, you know, with a two-year lag or the something. The city of Houston has done that, okay. uh, so there's nothing prohibiting uh, that kind of delay uh, for budgeting where last year's valuation determines next year's contribution Vision. rate. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, thanks for those comments, Mr. McGee. The, the only other comment that I would make uh, is something I think I heard you touch on, Michelle, uh, and that is if it, everything in a plan cannot be fixed. Something has got to give. Uh, unless we uh, know with uh, metaphysical certitude what's going to happen in the future, something is going to have to change. Um, and in a fixed rate plan, if the rate's not going to change, then something else has got to change. And we can't have uh, infinite amortization periods, and sometimes it's just going to have to be uh, the benefit structure is going to have to have some flexibility or give in it. <laughs> Did you finish saying what you wanted to say about fixed rate plans? Yes, thank you. Any other comments or questions on the fixed rate study? Will we see that in October? Yes, members, we will include a uh, first draft at the October board meeting. I would, I would just like to second Keith's comments on emphasizing, so I think that was a great point that should be included in this, that if you're going to fix one element on this, and Marsha was making this point as well, that benefits and, and money going in, the cost of benefits and money going in have to be aligned. To the extent that they're not, you're just setting yourself up to blow up the plan. Uh, and if you're going to fix contributions, then something else has to give, and the, really the only thing that can give is the benefit side eventually. Or you're going to have to relax the fi the fixed portion of that, and the longer you wait on that, the bigger the contribution increase that will be required to cover benefits. I think that is a really strong point. <clears throat> so uh, right now we're headed toward uh, having two studies to the legislature in January, one on asset pooling, one on uh, fixed rate plan funding policies. Is that, that right? Is yes. And we'll see more of that in uh, October. Anything else on those two studies? Not right at now? this time. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Ashley and Michelle. Date and location of next meeting of this committee. Do we have to decide that right now? No, we don't. We can all compare calendars. We'll ask staff to uh, get in touch with members of the committee. Uh, and this is the opportunity for audience participation. I'm opening it up. Anybody wish to uh, opine on anything pension or actuarial or which has been discussed here, please come forward and introduce yourself. David Stacy, Midland Fireman's Relief and Retirement Fund. I would love the opportunity to opine. Welcome. Um, <laughs> There were several comments made earlier in the evaluation of Orange and uh, Orange Fire and Marshall about the governance structure of the of the Telfer boards, and I it hacked me off. I take strong exception to the view that the governance structure of Telfer boards is inadequate or in any way uh, less than what it needs to be. The Telfer statute lays out that there are three stakeholders of the members. There are two stakeholders of the plan sponsor. And there are essentially two referees which don't work for the plan sponsor, which means they can't be part of the active membership either. So in theory, you have two disinterested parties. You have three interested parties and two plan sponsor parties. To me, that is the ultimate governance structure 
because all parties have the, the, the most motivated parties have the single majority of the of the three and you have a seven member board boards that get much larger than seven become more and more difficult to manage and and make decisions and, and work and as you've seen in various committees and things it's the larger the board is the, the more cumbersome it is to get things done and understand and recognize what needs to get done uh, with respect to the comment I would say that just like a, a good investment policy statement it's worthless if it's not implemented correctly that would be my response to your exception related to the Telfra board governance structure just like anything else if it's not implemented been doing this for a long time I've known a lot of different funds a lot of different plans and they have changed different ones over time where city members plan sponsor members were not actively engaged in the board for whatever reason they were rarely if ever at a board meeting until all of a sudden it all blows up and then oh no no we're right there well that's not the funds fault it's not the plans fault and it's not the board's fault same thing can be said for the active membership active membership members aren't engaged in the plan plan sponsor members and the, the, the referees are running the plan everything goes to pot it's not the board's fault it's the active members for not being engaged so I would offer that the governance structure of the Telfer plans is about as sound as it can get now the implementation of that in various instances may be in question thank you very much we appreciate you coming down today can I ask a question about this and again I apologize from my lack of knowledge on the subject but it wasn't so much my take on this wasn't so much that it was that the problem is the governance in of the board it's the cooperation between whoever especially in a collective bargaining situation if if the city is bargaining with the union and they come to an agreement regarding contributions but the board is setting benefits then that's the disc that's the governance problem and even though there are city representatives and and firefighter representatives on the board it's that the board was not a party to the negotiation of the contributions <clears throat> and, and that was my take it wasn't so much that the board is 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 structured improperly to put uh, it in my own language I would agree with that I, I don't think there's any I would not question the motivation or the governance internal to the board necessarily. I think additional scrutiny in some plans needs to be applied to assumptions. Um, I think there's uh, problems in who's making which decisions and what uh, they their interest is. Uh, and to put a finer point on what you said, in my own language, would be we're bargaining over the wrong thing. We're bargaining over contribution rates with benefits that are being earned, uh, and we should be bargaining over benefits and paying the cost. Yeah. Uh, and so it just okay. sets up a situation where benefits and costs get can get out of a line pretty easily because we're making the decision on the wrong thing. Um, I, I want to say that we are not posted to have discussion on Thank governance. Thank you. <laughs> the the oh. discussion we had was with regards to Orange Fire and, and Longview and yes, we don't have a specific agenda. And I, I will ask staff to add uh, governance. I think that the, the entire board, frankly, could use a primer on uh, governance among Texas public pension plans. And I think that sometimes folks have a bit of a narrow uh, definition of governance. To me, governance encompasses all of it, including the, uh, uh, the city council in this case, as well as the board and other entities. Um, but uh, I think that's fodder for a, another posted discussion. Thank you. Anybody else wish to approach the uh, the committee? Share their thoughts. Did you want to say anything? Okay, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.
post same sign, it passes. Thank you very much.